All right, good evening, everyone. It is Tuesday, November 19th, 2019, and uh, we are here for our regularly scheduled agenda setting session. Um, this meeting will be followed uh, by an executive session for the purposes of real estate exploration. Uh, and so I, I do need a roll call from the clerk, and um, we will have to have a vote to enter executive session. Davenport? Here. Parker? Here. Clean? Here. Wright? Present. Denson? Here. Neesmith? Present. Edwards? Here. Herod? Present. Thornton? Handy. We have a quorum. All right. Um, be uh, happy to entertain a motion for entering so, into executive session upon the conclusion of the agenda setting meeting. So moved. Second. All right. Got a motion from Commissioner Neesmith. I have a second from Commissioner Edwards. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So uh, following this, we will have that executive session. Um, we have uh, several opportunities for public input this evening, um, first on the consent agenda, uh, then on old and new business. Uh, rules of public input are the same. You will see a light on the clerk's desk right in front of me. It turns green when your time is beginning. It turns yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining, and it turns red when your time is up. Um, there are cards that are on the podium. If you do us the favor of just completing one of those cards so we can get the spelling of your name correctly and you could hand that card to the attorney who's right in front of the podium. So uh, first I'd uh, like to ask anybody to come to the podium. If you would like to make public comment on consent agenda items, which tonight are items number 1 through 16. So is there any member of the public who's with us tonight who would like to come speak to items 1 through 16? All right, seeing none, uh, is there any commissioner who would like to remove an item from consent? Uh, commissioner Herod. Uh, five and nine, I've got a couple of questions, please. All right. Any other? Commissioner Hamby? I have five as well. Okay. All right, and uh, I'm going to remove item six. Um, we have some outside support with us this evening, and so just wanted to provide an opportunity for... Uh, our bond council and our financial advisor related to the SPLOST referendum uh, to be able to answer any questions commissioners had. So uh, again, uh, five, six, and nine will be uh, removed from consent. Um, uh, we'll handle those first and then we'll come back to old and new business. Um, Andy, do you wanna go ahead and begin with number five? Sure, I guess <clears throat> this is really a question for the attorney. So we're talking about replacing uh, guardrails that have been damaged in various different ways. Obviously, sometimes that just happens because accidents happen. But in instances where, for example, let's say a guardrail is hit by a drunk driver and they're damaging public property, is there any way that we can recover any costs for replacing the public's property from somebody that's convicted of something like drunk driving or, or some reckless driving or something like that? We can, Commissioner. And uh, that would be a recovery of file an action for recovery of property damage claim. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I intended to discuss based upon this preliminary discussion the other night with the county manager, and I had a chance yet to do this, is that GMA has a program where they would perform that service at no cost and they review all the police reports uh, <clears throat> and find the evidence of the damage, uh, help find the evidence of damage. And uh, of course, and not at no cost, they get a percentage, but mm -hmm. it's at no cost to us, you know. But uh, so y the answer to that is 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 yes, and uh, uh, that is something that we certainly could look into the best way to achieve that. Okay, so we, do we have to proactively ask them to do that, or to? No, we don't have to hire anybody else. It's just that they're so proficient at it, they go back three years. No, and, uh, I guess what I meant is if we wanted to have this as a policy, what do we need to do to ensure oh. that it happens? Well, if the commission, you know, wanted to ensure it happened, we could approve the commission could approve a resolution with a policy attached there too that specified that directed the manager's office or the appropriate department to finance to begin the process of of uh, recovery of damage claims, property damage claims. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, I haven't talked to anybody else, but I, that's something I would like to pursue. Commissioner Hamby. Sure. sure. Thank you, Mayor. I. Uh, and uh, this was regarding over on Timothy Road. I, I'd called in a, a work order a while, a uh, couple of weeks ago. And um, at that time, I was informed that this would be on the agenda, which I thought was a, a, a good thing, and I appreciate it being on here. However, I, when I'm looking at the list, the one I was calling about is not on the list uh, for, for Timothy Road. And so I'm not sure 
what to what to do about that. Um, I guess I could do it, commission to find an option or something, but uh, maybe we could chat between now and the voting session. Um, it's the one, and um, I've had several phone calls about it. Uh, we were in front of a Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Uh, it has a guardrail, and it's gotten quite beat up, and it's uh, pr probably not probably not meeting its criteria for being a, being a guardrail at this point in time. So, okay, look at that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Nee Smith. Yeah, I was wondering. Uh, I guess I'll start with the manager. What, what, what in, in case of an accident where a guardrail is damaged, what actions do we need to take in order to get that into the recovery process? Well, you're asking the same questions I asked when I, this came to me, and uh, and part of it starts with you know linking the the, the accident to the, the damage, and so I talked to the police chief about you know is there something on the current police reports that indicates there's damage to public property and there's not. And you could, you know, police officers aren't claims adjusters, but we should, we've got to know if, if we know who did it, then that gives us a, a trail to pursue. And I do think it's appropriate, but I'll obviously defer to the attorney. And I, I know there are companies that help municipalities, you know, pursue damages to public infrastructure. Um, so I, I, again, I'll defer to the attorney on that. But this, I think from, if it's possible, we should, Pursue trying to get reimbursed for that damage. Looks generally favorable toward ensuring that whether it's through GMA or another outsourcing agent that we ensure that we're being compensated for that damage to public property. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll go ahead and put a package together to that effect. Leave it off consent for now. That we can leave that off consent. Sure. On that on that Wright, line, yes. line of thinking, we would just start with the address of the accident on the police report. Well, is, is that it, enough? So there's, there's so more? many police reports. We we got to know that there was damage because Public Works doesn't. It's not in the habit of reconciling police reports. I mean, the, whoever the entity is, the address would get them started. It seems like yes, that 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 there you know there was a drunk driver. It smashed into the guardrail. There's considerable damage that you know that needs to be noted and linked to the address and the person that purportedly did that you know some of it's going to be single car accidents they drive off we never know but mm -hmm. where we can we should pursue it gotcha. commissioner needs me to follow up uh, commissioner Ryan, i think you understand we, we do need to have a record that that accident caused that damage right okay in other words it's got to be noted that there yep. was damage all right, so we'll leave that one off consent. Um, moving on, I, I pulled item number six. Um, for those folks new to the commission, um, or, or even if you've been on the commission a little while, you may not have seen a, um, a SPLOST or a T-SPLOST referendum. Uh, and so there are a series of cascading activities that happen following successful um, conclusion of the referendum, which we obviously had and we're very happy about with 78% um, positive affirmation of our SPLOST package, which I think speaks well to the work of everybody in this room. Um, and uh, one of those things is uh, item number six. There's another later on, item number 27. Um, Blaine, do you want to talk a little bit about how um, sort of our outside counsel and financial advisor sort of play in, and then I'll give commissioners an opportunity to ask any questions they may have about that? Uh, to the bonds for the SPAS? Yes. Yes, uh, yeah, so um, our finance department's obviously involved. Um, uh, the, 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 the voters approved the referendum to um, to sell bonds to help front end some of the projects uh, that the mayor and commission and the citizens felt were important. Uh, so we do have a financial advisor. Um, we also um, will be working closely with uh, Attorney Drake and um, Smith Gambrell, which is a bond attorney out of Atlanta. And those four groups in our SPLA staff will uh, organize the sale of bonds, which we project to be in February. Uh, so that funds would be available in February to move these projects forward. Uh, any commissioners have questions just about that mechanism? Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. We just want to make sure you had that opportunity since we've got some special guests here tonight. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate your work on this very much. Thanks, David. Uh, David Boyd, our finance director, is here as well. Um, all right, so I'm going to put that one back on consent. Um, and then uh, Mr. the Mr. Mayor, isn't there some yeah. information missing on it though about the vote count? Uh, it, it does have just the template, and um, 
are we going to see, uh, Mr. Yes. Manager, the build-in template by yes, the sir. voting meeting? Of course. Yeah, we received that information today, and I think if Robin has it, she will forward it to the clerk. She's got it. Okay. I mean, I don't have a problem putting it back on consent, but it's not technically a sure, complete, complete document. Correct. That's right. All right. Uh, moving on to item number nine. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hare, you asked for this one to be removed as well. I, I did. I just had a question. I'm excited about the um, the new technology that I think will be coming to our buses, and I just had a question. So. I looked at some of the screen, or some of the photographs rather, of the screens that we will see on the inside of the buses, um, which all looks great. I think it'll be really helpful for passengers. My question is as follows. <coughs> if we put one of these in a bus, and then at some point the bus is either involved in an accident where it's not, it can't be used anymore, or it's cycled out from our um, vehicle replacement um, activities, can these be put in the new buses, or is this once it's installed in the bus, it stays with the bus regardless? Um, I, I need to confirm this with transit, but uh, my assumption is it can be reinstalled if it okay. didn't sustain any damage. Okay. Now, you know, there's setup and configuration, there's certain installation things that need to go on with the new bus, but if it's working, it can be reused. Okay. Any other questions about nine? Happy to put that back on consent. Okay. That's it. Gene. Uh, yes, Andrew Williams. And, and I'm sorry, but I didn't, didn't convey this earlier, but speaking with Assistant Manager London, uh, we need to uh, ask you to remove the home award. Um, uh, for public hearing. Yeah, because of a public hearing, the need for public hearing. Item number 13. So, uh, 13, the home award will go to new business. Okay. All right. Um, now, with the consent agenda taken care of, we will move on to old and new business. I'm about to do that. Yeah. So, uh, moving on to old and new business, um, rules of public input are the same for old and new business. So, if you would like to speak to items 13 or 17 through 29, Now's that time. Again, that's uh, 13 and 17 through 29. Uh, rules are the same as prior. Uh, when the light turns green, uh, go ahead and begin speaking. You have three minutes. When you have 30 seconds remaining, you will see the light turn yellow. And then when the three minutes is up, you'll see the light turn red. Um, again, uh, the input cards are on the podium. If you could just uh, complete that so we can spell your name correctly in the record. Hello, I'm Jill Bateman. I live at 1501 Wellbrook Road, Watkinsville, Georgia. I'm a member of Athens First United Methodist Church and I'm currently serving as the chair of our building committee. Three years ago, our committee began a future planning process to evaluate our properties in use. We engaged conversations with some downtown property owners, church leaders, and Vision Athens leaders, and our church staff to talk through some strategic planning considerations in fulfilling the church's missions. These exercises, along with architects, environmental assessments, and systems evaluations, determined that replacement costs for our 110 West Hancock building would range at $3 million. Even with this significant financial commitment, it wouldn't address the condition of the building, which has been described as aging and poor condition by architects. Many of the First Methodist outreach programs, partnerships, and community activities were based in the 110 West Hancock building, which the church has determined is not suitable for continued use. Unfortunately, our efforts under existing law to demolish this building brought about the moratorium and our current proposal for tonight. A key point to consider tonight is a requirement the visibly perceptible section of the municipality or county requirement of the local historic preservation ordinance and state law. This large district fails that test. The architecture is a mix. From post-World War II, single-story masonry buildings to apartment buildings for seniors built in 1977 to a modernist government building, and there's an 1840s mansion and numerous vacant lots and non-contributing properties. The only characteristic these buildings have in common is that they are strikingly different. The 110 West Hancock building illustrates why this requirement is also not met. 
Just look to its neighbors along the two blocks of the north side of West Hancock and bound by West Daughtery. You'll notice the Synovus built in 2008 and the vacant lots between. It's important to consider the 14 parcels within these two blocks. Only four properties are identified as contributing. These two blocks are not visibly perceptible of any historic characteristic. And across Darty Street, there are two modernist buildings built in 1969 and 1977 with the first AME education building sandwiched between. Again, there's no visibly perceptible historic characteristic in this vicinity. These examples show that the proposed district does not meet one of the requirements of state law or local ordinance, visibly perce perceptible section of the community. First Methodist and our four church other churches included in this proposed district should have the same opportunity to adapt, grow, and serve as other faith institutions and charities that are not in historic districts. I present a signed petition by our First Methodist Church Sunday School members, 175 of them, 115 live in athens Clark County. These individuals join in respectfully requesting that you deny this proposal. Thank you, Ms. Bateman. And the attorney can take that from you. I'm Joseph Carter. I live at 175 Oglethorpe Avenue. And I'm here to speak uh, strongly in favor of the uh, historic designation of the Western District. And I want to put it in context. Um, the context of this institution, the context of our downtown. <clears throat> I've gotten my hair cut at Brown's for about 16 years. And when I go into Browns every time, I see a legacy of black workers that stretch back several generations. And right next door is Mr. Wilson's. Should this designation not pass, I'm very afraid, and I think the commissioner on Link is spoken to this there are a lot of people who are eyeing these properties for larger developments condominiums I don't trust a lot of these business owners they need to come to the government to ask for permission because if this government does not protect the heritage that is Hot Corner, then it commits the same thing that it did to Town, where the dorms are. That will be your legacy of not protecting a heritage of African-American communities whose properties are constantly dispossessed. Do you want that to be your heritage? Because it already is. I see Mr. Brown's property taxes going up. I see Mr. Wilson's. And then they leave. That will be your legacy. The erasure of another black community. Think about it. That is what is really at hand. So yes, these businesses should come to the government to ask permission to sell, to redevelop, because that's the only way that you can actually maintain power that these communities no longer have. So I speak strongly in favor of this, and you should too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Bill Hopper. I live at 564 University Drive in Athens, Clark County. I'm the current deacon chair at First Baptist Church in Athens, which is located at 355 Pulaski Street. Uh, we're in the block that's bound by Newton, Hancock, Pulaski, and, and Prince. I've been a member of First Baptist Church for 36 years, and I've been a business person in this community for 36 years. First Baptist has been downtown since 1830. 
We've been in our present location since 1921. Since 1921, the church has been through several additions and modifications of our physical facility. As recently as three years ago, we spent $4 million renovating our facility. One of the reasons we renovated, or a portion of the reason we renovated, was to be able to accommodate our daily bread. Our daily bread is housed in First Baptist Church. It serves 100 to 200 of our most needy families every day, uh, two meals a day for five days a week, 52 weeks a year. We also house Interfaith Hospitality Network of Athens, whose uh, stated mission is now Family Promise of Athens, whose stated mission is to allow homeless families to achieve sustainable independence. Uh, there are five downtown churches in the proposed historic district. All of those downtown churches oppose this proposal. Uh, all of them contributed in a significant way to the health of the downtown community. Beyond the descent of the five churches in the proposed district, opposition from other property owners is overwhelming. 75% of property owners are opposed. 78% of contributing properties are opposed. No previous historical district has been established in athens Clark County with such a high percentage of non-contributing parcels. I think there's 40% that are non-contributing. 19% uh, of the proposed district are vacant lots. The period of significance extends from 1804 to 1970 and includes 16 buildings, approximately one-third of the total contributing structures, which were constructed in a whole or part after 1940. Neither the Envision Action Agenda nor the 2018 Comprehensive Plan call for the creation of new historic districts in downtown Athens. Both plans recommend that the community develop a historic resources master plan. No plan has yet been developed. Just months after the completion of the Comprehensive Plan, some elected official staff and a historic preservation committee uh, propose a district that, that departs significantly from prior historic designations. Any effort to adopt a historic district should first be based on a historic resource master plan, which must include a community conversation about the cost and the benefits, uh, especially when the definition of a period of significance is broadened to include literally hundreds of residential, commercial, and institutional buildings built after 1940. I respectfully request you deny this application, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hopper. Hi, good evening. I'm Chris Conley, and I'm at 741 Nanahala Avenue. Uh, I would also speak against the recognition of this proposed historic preservation district. Uh, we already have the 2006 downtown design standards along with the alternative compliance guidelines. Uh, unlike the current proposal, the way those cre were created was collaborative. It was deliberative. It was nuanced. This new program would throw all of that out and start from scratch. Uh, basically, I see two huge advantages to sticking with our current approach or slightly tweaking it rather than going with this new proposal. The first one deals with the fact that the current system allows flexibility in a range of vision and not the type of rigidity and narrowness of focus that will necessarily impair residents of Athens and especially the poor. Uh, my wife and I restored our own home in the Boulevard Historic District four years ago. So I'm familiar with the process and the system, uh, and I think it has a great value. Uh, but what I saw with the HPC during that process is it is rigidly bound by its guidelines. It can't look at broader interests separate and apart from those historical guidelines about what best serves our community as a whole. Um, what we need is what the comprehensive plan and the current policies allow, which is a broader perspective of what's in the best interest of the community as a whole, looking at the historical value, which I think First Baptist Church, which I'm a member of, has done a good job, but also looking at other questions as well. In particular, I'm very proud of First Baptist Church and the way that we are currently trying to be very flexible and creative in how we address homelessness and hunger in Athens. Um, maybe there are other places downtown that allow homeless people to shelter on their property at night. I'm unaware of those. Uh, maybe there are other people that are working as hard as we are to do the Our Daily Bread feeding ministry that feeds hundreds of people a day. I'm unaware of those. What, what I do not want to have happen is to see our creativity and flexibility for future uses of our property 
handcuffed by this, this policy. The second big thing that I see that's an advantage of the current system over the proposed new system is that it avoids a false assumption of this monolithic, homogenous downtown Athens. That the entire downtown Athens is, is one thing. You know, I think that was one of the great things about the prior 2006 downtown design standards was it recognized a single historic district and five character areas. This new plan would just indiscriminately cut across three of those character areas, treating them as the same, and throwing out some of the distinctions that makes our downtown so distinctive. Uh, those are some of the reasons I think that, that this new policy is a bad idea for Athens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Good evening. Evening. I'm Kenny Calavota. I live at 108 Chickadee Court, way out at the end of the county. But I also am involved. My law firm owns a building downtown, law firm of Hudson, Montgomery, Calavota, and Conley. We're right across the street from the last resort restaurant. The proposed western downtown Athens historic district covers the area approximately from Lumpkin Street to Newton Street from Broad Street to the north side of Dowdery Street. The one row of buildings along the west side of Lumpkin from Broad to the Georgia Theater is already in the existing downtown district. And this is where the Globe is, Ty Spoon, Little Italy are located. The proposed district generally runs to the west down and across Pulaski Street and it's roughly in the shape of a rectangle. This proposed district generally includes the contributing structures in this geographic area as well as a number of non-contributing buildings. And those non-contributing buildings include the parking garage, game day, Chase Bank, Sonovus, Chamber of Commerce building. Look at what's left out. Georgia Heights, this gigantic apartment complex that surrounds our law firm building, occupies a majority of the block between Broad and Clayton from Lumpkin to Hull. It hulks over this block of Clayton Street. It's not included in the district. Directly across the street from the last resort is a parking lot located at 175 West Clayton Street. It is not included in the district. The only building in the whole block to be included in the district is our building located at 183 West Clayton Street. The remainder of this block will not be subject to the guidelines which apply to the rest of the district. No changes to the Georgia Heights building will be subject to the requirement for a certificate of appropriateness, nor will any COA be required for any building on the parking lot at 175 West Clayton Street. The district as drawn is flawed because the vast bulk of one whole block at the interface with the existing district is excluded. While the rest of the properties on this block labor under the guidelines and the control of the Historic Preservation Commission, the owners of these properties, and that's Georgia Heights and 175 West Clayton, are free to do what they want, unrestricted, unrestrained, regardless of the effect on the rest of the block. No one has yet given a good explanation for why this block was left out of the district. Georgia Heights is not in the National Register District, but then neither are Game Day, Chase Bank, the Tillman Building, the Chamber of Commerce Building, or the churches and other structures west of Pulaski Street. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Calvo. Good evening. My name is Joe Tillman. I live at 145 High Ridge Drive in Athens. I'm no stranger to historic designations. Uh, I serve currently as a trustee on one of our town's nationally registered historic places, Oconee Hill Cemetery. Tonight, I represent my family with properties we own at 295 West Clayton Street and 125 Pulaski Street. Our Pulaski Street parking lot, which is on the corner of Pulaski and Broad, is outside and not contiguous to the current National Historic District. It's also across the street from the stated Pulaski Street boundary 
of the proposal that the HPC st uh, stated. They said Pulaski Street was the boundary, but I believe they've overreached going across it to include my and other properties such as this. Also, our property is pres uh, proposed as non-contributing, while other parking lots that are actually touching the National Historic District boundary are excluded totally from the proposal, such as 175 Clayton Street. Our building at 295 West Clayton, the southern end of it, is also outside the National Historic District, but it is proposed as non-contributing, while other similar buildings outside the district also are totally excluded from the proposal, for instance, Georgia Heights, which was just mentioned a moment ago. These ca cases clearly <clears throat> represent inconsistent and inequitable treatment of property owners, and I respectfully request that our two properties be omitted from this proposed new historic district. As well, I believe the ex uh, to extend the period of significance to 1970 and beyond has serious ramifications inside and outside of downtown. Construction in Athens boomed after 1940, and a period of significance that ends in 1970 sweeps in hundreds of residential, commercial, and industrial bu institutional buildings, even entire subdivisions. This is a significant departure from prior district designations. The mayor and commission should follow strategies that others have mentioned tonight from the 2018 Comprehensive Plan and Envision Athens to develop a historic resource master plan. There should be community conversation to determine what kind of buildings are actually worthy of permanent preservation. And this uh, desire should be balanced with other important community goals, such as environmental protection, affordable housing, job creation, economic prosperity. Any decisions to establish districts should come with clear, rational reasons why the properties or districts warrant permanent protection. Property owners and the community at large deserve a larger discussion and plan so that investment decisions can be made in a stable economic environment with uniformly applied regulations. Historic preservation should not be weaponized with decisions about protecting some structures but not others be made on an ad hoc basis as apparently this has been done in this proposal. Therefore, I respectfully request that you deny this proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Honorable Commissioners, good evening. I'm Casey Mull. I'm a fourth generation member of First Christian Church on the corner of West Doherty and Pulaski Street. I'm pleased to be part of the collective voice of concerns for the five faith communities included in the proposed historical district expansion, concerns shared by business and property owners. First Christian and other faith communities remain in downtown Athens. We sustain significant maintenance and operational costs of buildings more than a century old and contribute in partnership ministries in the downtown area. It's clear that these faith communities provide intentional downtown ministries while being good stewards of their properties in what our 2018 comprehensive plan called everyone's neighborhood. Historical preservation commissions are charged with and restricted to answering, does a proposed change have a substantial adverse effect on the aesthetic, historical, historic, or architectural significance and value of a historic property or the historic district? Development decisions must pass through these historic preservation commissions. <clears throat> Therefore, there's lack of balance in considering the cost and the benefits. Historical preservation commissions cannot consider cost and benefits regarding a proposed change, nor can they consider other community values expressed in long-range planning documents, SPELOST votes, or existing land, land use ordinances. Keeping downtown everyone's neighborhood should require the participation of elected officials and the entire community. It should not be delegated to the limited jurisdiction of a historic preservation commission. July 2018 saw historic hail damage across Clark County. It affected our roof at First Christian that's more than 100 years old. Should our church have been required to apply for a certificate of appropriateness, there's no certainty that the request would have been approved as presented. The Historic Preservation Committee might have determined that modern materials 
which we chose to best protect the interior of our, uh, to best protect the integrity of our interior dome and our internal assets may have had signif significant adverse effect leading to more time, fees, and appeal. It could have even questioned our ability to remain in everyone's neighborhood. Conversation, considerations, and cost benefit analysis support our goal of keeping downtown everyone's neighborhood. Let's not eliminate the voices of everyone for the voices of an appointed commission. I present a petition signed on Sunday at First Christian. There are 50 signatures, 42 of whom are athens Clark County residents. I respectfully request that you deny this request of the local historic designation. Thank you, Mr. Mull. Good evening. I'm David Montgomery. Y'all know from the email that I sent that I've spent some time considering historic preservation from where y'all are tonight. I live at 147 East Boggs Street in Lexington, but I'm uh, in the law firm with Kenny Calavota at 183 West Clayton. Our law firm has been in one form or another in downtown Athens since 1958. I've been there since 1970. So we're committed business people in this city, and we care about downtown. I want to take a second and first address two fallacies or misconceptions that have come up in the discussion about this proposed district. And the first is that the objectors are somehow out-of-towners who are not committed to this city. Now, in the instance of Georgia of, of game day, there were many objections from the condo owners there, and a lot of them are indeed from out of town. But throughout the rest of this proposed district, the objectors are local people, many of whom have been here for generations. So it's not some out of town person that's objecting to this designation. The other thing I'd like to address is the idea that keeping rents low by keeping property taxes low, by keeping the value of the properties low, is a good thing for this commission to do. Uh, there's been some discussion that rents are too high because property taxes are too high. Well, property taxes result from a tax rate and property values. And I see no indication that this body or the Board of Education is going to cut the tax rate so the only way we can lower property taxes is to suppress the value or devalue uh, the existing properties. Uh, I do not believe that that's a legitimate aim of a government or a legitimate use of a historic uh, preservation ordinance. You know, this fact that it might result that the inaction of this or the creation of this district might result in lower property values, I don't think is lost on the downtown owners. That may be why so few of those owners were supportive of this. Of the uh, objections, uh, or I'm sorry, the people that support it, it comes down to, from my looking at the, the list, four or five uh, property owners, some of whom own multiple lots. I speak tonight not only for myself, but for Homer Wilson, whose family owns uh, the property on North Hull Street. Those are the folks that will be most hurt by this uh, because you, of the Ms. limits Montgomery. on what they can do. Thank you. I'm Ken Parker, live at 520 West Rutherford Street here in Athens. My family happens to own the property at 233 West Hancock, and I wanted to um, straighten something out. I know there's things to talk about the out-of-town owners. On your list that you have, it says it's I'm an out-of-town owner. Obviously, I'm not, but the tax bill is paid by my tenant who lives out of state, and so that's why you may get the idea that they're out of town. 
I'm not. Um, we obviously we're here, so we can straighten that out. My problem with the whole historic district is claiming a building is historic based merely on its age. There are many that aren't economically feasible, and there's many, and I think my building is one of those that really has no architectural significance. I think there needs to be flexibility to look at each building, each case by case, and I feel that this, this won't do that, and so that's why I'm opposed to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. <clears throat> All right. Any other public input this evening? Good evening. My name is Tommy Valentine, 395 Cleveland Avenue, speaking on behalf of Historic Athens. Um, I'm amending my remarks a little bit. I did not come here today to talk about churches, but I want to just touch on it for a second. Um, so I'm a member of a Coney Street United Methodist Church, uh, sister congregation to one of the congregations affected by this. And when our church burned down and we could no longer serve our daily bread, um, you know, one of the other churches that spoke tonight took up that cause. Um, churches are really important. Some of our most important historic resources in this town, in any town, are churches. We all know what it felt like to see Notre Dame Cathedral burn. Um, but we're losing all our parking on Cars Hill because... Uh, the old Oconee Street School is being rehabilitated. And everyone at our church agrees that supporting that is part of being a good community steward, being a good community church. It's why we don't pay property taxes. For all the good we do, we're just a member of this community. And if we had purchased that important historic building and had proposed to tear it down to replace it with parking sp spaces, I would be counting on you as, this, you know, as the leaders in this community to stop us. Um, the other thing I just want to quickly remark on churches that I hope helps everyone in here take a deep breath is Historic Athens is proposing only the boundaries of the National Register District. That's the bold district. That's the district that's been acknowledged as historic since the 80s, um, which doesn't feel like that long ago, but it is. Uh, four out of five of the churches that have ex issued concerns tonight are not in the district we're suggesting. Instead, what we're suggesting is that you finish a job that's been long coming. Uh, earlier today, I was in our offices at Old Fire Hall Number 2, and I came across this uh, old bumper sticker, Downtown Athens Preserve It, with our old name, Athens Clark Heritage Foundation. And it just, it's a sign of how long we've been working to do this, but also that the process works. Um, the more architecturally contiguous, wealthier side of town, the side that looks all like one place, was already preserved with consensus. And I agree, the other section doesn't have one dominant architectural style. But that's the story of Athens. That's the value of this. This was the more marginalized, more industrial, more musical, more African-American section of town. It doesn't look like all one place, and that has value to our story. People who have sat in the seats that you're sitting in now and people who have been at the microphone where I am now have argued this in the past. And in a true historic fashion, you have a chance right now to finish their work with this vote. The process has been deliberative. We've been reaching out to property owners since January. I'm also happy to continue sending over any information for those of you that are interested on the massive amounts of evidence that suggests that this district will increase property values for all, including those who wish to sell later, and all who wish to redevelop. Uh, in closing, let me just say that I'd like to ask all of you to think about the new target development taking place at University Tower. Think about how the historic district process helped that along and helped it be an intelligent development process. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Valentine. Thank you. This is all right. There you go. Good evening. My name is Betsy Butler. I'm a serve as clergy over at Athens First United Methodist Church. I have actually lived in Athens for almost 20 years, so I'm a resident. I live at 760 Glenwood Drive, 30606. We've heard a lot tonight, and what I really want to come forth and talk about is what I believe matters most, is the heart of Athens. It's the people in this community. We at Athens First serve our neighbors, but more than serving our neighbors, we know our neighbors, and we love our neighbors. We know that Cassandra rides a bus for almost two hours to get 10 minutes to her job down the street. We know she cares for her dad and that she's raising her twin girls on her own. We know that they're at Clark Central High School and we know because we go to IEP meetings with them and we are there for them and their family. 
We know Tracy, who's raising her grandson because he watched his mom get struck and killed by a car while they were walking home one night, and he was left there as a three-year-old until Tracy could get to him, and he lives with her. We know Katrina because we are with her children and have been for 10 years plus, watching them go to school, going to their fifth and eighth grade graduations, shepherd them to homecoming, taking them and giving them experience in Athens that they may or may not have otherwise gone to. And we know Tyra, who has recently moved here after her tragic story of losing one of her twins and raising her three children on her own. We know them because we spend time with them. We know them because we are building relationships with them. Creating the Western Downtown Athens Local Historic District would hinder our effectiveness to do ministry and to grow outreach. Spending financial resources used to progress through multiple government reviews for design planning will cause us to have to redirect these resources and that otherwise would be used to free, feed our hungry guests, to house and keep power on in some of the homes of the people that you and I both know, or to even keep people from sleeping on the streets. We help the people in our community, and we do this out of a call to empower them, to empower our neighbors, so that we might bring hope and transformation to their lives, but to this community. I believe we have the same goals. You guys sitting up here, and us who are serving along with you in this community. I believe that as elective officials, you have committed to advocating for the deep needs of this community. And I believe as a community of faith, we have done the same. And so I'm asking you tonight, will you partner with us for the good of this community? The proposed district adds layers to an already complex process which pulls valuable financial and volunteer resources away from service opportunities. And these opportunities would benefit all of Athens Clark County. I thank you for your time and your consideration, but I respectfully request that you deny this proposal. Thank you, Ms. Butler. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Amy Andrews. I live at 282 King Avenue, and I am speaking in favor of the Western Downtown Athens Local Historic District. Um, I think we have been through this process before, and our current district was a long time coming, and it was a painful process, but I think we can all agree it is working. And I think we have, in this new proposed district, we have already lost several substantial buildings over the years, the Samaritan Building, the Union Hall, which were African American office buildings, one behind First United Methodist Church, where the parking lot is now, and one across the street next to the Morton Theater where there's another parking lot. And you'll see the probably the greatest majority of empty lots are in this district. And there's a great opportunity there. And so what we can do is if we have this district, we can see creative adaptive reuse of the existing buildings. We can see improvements to those that are non-contributing. And then we can also see that any development of these empty lots is going to be uh, creative and good for the community versus more buildings like Uncommon and the other student complexes. So I would urge you to um, consider this district. It is painful. It does require a lot of compromises. But all in all, it's going to be better. I think in any local historic district, whether it's downtown or in residential, there is um, a lot of fear, a lot of painful process to go through, but it ultimately is for the better of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andrews. Any other public input this evening on the rest of old new business? All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and come behind the rail. Um, we have a couple of um, Old and new business items, uh, can, as referenced earlier, we're going to be moving item number 13 to new business, given that we have to have a public hearing on that. Um, uh, let's go to item number 17, old business. Uh, this uh, request for the tower at 855 Nowhere Road. Uh, any additional input on this item? Uh, Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, this is an... Um, <laughs> In my district, and we, we discussed this uh, last month, and it's coming back before us after we heard uh, substantial concerns from uh, some residents in the area. Uh, I just want to uh, let the public know that um, 
I'll be uh, meeting with concerned residents who live in that area uh, tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. at the Danielsville Road uh, Firehouse uh, at 2.30 p.m. So that is open to the public for anybody who has concerns there, and uh, they can get some questions answered. Uh, I think something that is important that uh, at least I learned about today, if not this entire body, that was presented from um, our county attorney that uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, uh, the federal act, um, for the most part, uh, severely restricts us to be able to um, deny uh, any, of these, uh, any of these zoning changes for these towers based on health or environmental impacts, um, which uh, definitely uh, limits us a bit. So that's one of the things that um, we can kind of discuss a little bit further uh, at that meeting tomorrow, but I think that um, it definitely cinches our hands a little bit here. Thank you, Commissioner. I do plan on being at that meeting tomorrow, and I do know about the 1996 um, regulation, and um, I still would like to invite the community to come out and express their um, concerns. Um, we have seen more than once when the federal government has said FDA or anybody says something is good or something is bad, it doesn't mean that it is so. So um, I will be there tomorrow. I'm, I will be listening, and I will be ready to make a decision at the right time. Any other input on item number 17? Right, uh, moving on to item number 18, uh, this is the uh, newest iteration of the prosperity package and workforce development. Uh, activities. You've got some uh, additional items in your packet. Um, uh, assistant Manager Lonan or uh, Manager Williams, uh, one of you may want to just sort of outline the new materials that we have with us in our packet tonight, um, added to the items that we previously saw. Sure, thank you. And um, so we received the comments back from uh, communities and schools, Family Connection, uh, regarding the agreement that uh, the attorney drafted. And so there was some back and forth there. It's now an attachment uh, so that you can see the scope of work. And um, uh, we've co corrected some of the uh, mistakes that were in the agenda item as far as the grant specialist coordinator. It's two grant specialists. And the budget amendments are now correct and aligned with the agreement. Okay. Thank you, Manager Williams. Uh, Commissioner Neesmith. Uh, so we're still talking about dedicating a large portion of our $4 million to neighborhood leaders, $800,000. And to me, this is uh, ready, fire, aim. Uh, it's not appropriate. Um, we don't know that we need that many neighborhood leaders. We don't completely know what their jobs are. Uh, we don't know how to measure their performance. Um, we don't know what their goals are. Um, I believe there's some there's some credibility to having such a program, but to jump into it with both feet at this time, I think, is potentially a large waste of money. Uh, I still contend that uh, we should, uh, first of all, ask our community partners for ideas that they have, and, and we select some of those ideas, we modify some of those ideas, we ask for, we determine what kind of funding these ideas will need, and we move forward with that. Then we can decide how to spend money on something like neighborhood leaders and where they should be. The idea of them being defined by school districts is uh, whimsical. It could just as well be based on commission districts. Uh, whether every commission district needs one or two, we could determine that with census tract studies and determine a good, good way to allocate them. But first, let's figure out what we're doing before we throw $800,000 at the problem. Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I am definitely in support of this. Um, the Neighborhood Leaders Program is a proven program that is effective, that has actually helped uh, many people in the past, and I feel like it will help many people in the future. We can't do this extremely complex, ambitious work without organizing. 
Uh, we need to have people who understand the communities that we're trying to reach, who understand the struggles that they go through. And the best way to do that is to tap and hire in people who are in those communities who understand those struggles to actually be the, the tip of the spear that goes on into this program. And that's what this does. Um, I'd like to point out that um, with the reason that we're going with the school districts and not can, uh, commission districts is so that we can have a more accurate idea of the population, non-college student population. If we had it based on commission districts, the <coughs> commission districts that overlap with a lot of student population, call UJ population, it would throw off the, how we're actually focusing the organizers. By doing it through the school districts, and the only reason we're doing that has nothing to do with the school districts, is because those districts are already partitioned off in a way that takes into effect spreading out the population that is non-college student population, which I think we would all agree here that college students are not the target of this program. Um, and I do agree that it's a great idea to reach out to our community partners to get uh, proposals and ideas for us to use towards um, the prosperity package. And I'm excited to say that that's exactly what we've done here. Um, Family Connection and Communities and Schools is a community partner that's been doing great work in this area for a long time. And I'm excited that we were able to work with them to develop a proposal and actually move forward. Um, and I greatly welcome uh, any other community partners to work with commissioners to bring future proposals forward because uh, we have $3.2 million still to spend in this, in this, part, in this prosperity package. Um, and the fiscal year is kind of running out here. So um, I'm excited to support this and to see this move forward. Commissioner Parker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to add to what Commissioner Denson, Denson has said in emphasizing that we have a huge proliferation of nonprofits in this county. And they, they do important work. They all have their vision for how their contri contributions can uplift the people of the community, but their insight alone has not tackled the problems that we face here in Athens. What we have not had as a part of those conversations oftentimes is the insight of folks that have lived within these communities and have close cultural connections to the folks living in those communities and thus can bring in a more grassroots view of what solutions to our issues look like. And I think we've done a great job in putting together this tier, these two tiers of the prosperity package in a way that mobilizes folks on the ground to begin doing that work and ask of the folks who are most in need what their priorities are for themselves and how we can best meet those needs rather than going to folks that are speaking for perhaps on high about how to meet those needs. And so um, mm -hmm. I, too, am very supportive of this initial phase of work, um, and I look forward to supporting it on the third. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Davenport. I am not in support of this prosperity package. Um, I think it's a, a good I think it's a good try, but it's not what what we campaigned, what the new commissioners campaigned on. I want to pick it back out to Commissioner Neesmith. I think eight hundred thousand dollars for um, for community development neighborhood leaders is a waste of taxpayer dollars. Um, that money should be going into the people's pocket or somehow in a program that actually goes into people's pocket. Um, there's just a I would highly prefer for us to go through a um, the um, the poverty simulation so we can actually understand what poverty looks like in Athens Clark County. Um, this to me, I cannot support, but if my colleagues support it, by all means do so. But I am dead darn serious about protecting and helping the people who live in Athens Clark County, live in poverty, get out of poverty. And this is just this is not the way that we should be doing it. Commissioner Link. Um, I am supportive of this Neighborhood <coughs> Leaders Program because, like Commissioner Denson said, on-the-ground organizing is the key for any effort. you got to meet people where they are, where they live, at their front doors, and nobody's going to volunteer to do that. We've got to hire people to, to do that work because it is work. Um, and this also enables the ability to put these folks through some training to, to know how to best accomplish that work. And I believe it does have some um, reporting and, and accountability measures in here. Um, it, you know, it talks about tier one, tier two. 
um, it, it has a process by which um, you know these folks will do the work and they'll there'll be some accountability and follow through um, I mean I think that I mean this is the groundwork you got us you you got to spend money up front to, to implement an effective program um, so and, and you know family connection is they have they have the experience they have a long history of success in the community um, this is a program that you know had some success when it was funded and it's a program that that can like Commissioner Denson said can be the tip of the spear and can bring those resources from other organizations into the communities and those might be resources that are funded through this prosperity package as well Commissioner Wright yeah, I, this question might be for the manager or whoever. It, on page 188 of the big package, it's uh, number 17. It's talking about, I'm reading this as a renewal. If this were to pass, it sounds like it automatically renews itself unless by December 31st, unless we terminate it 30 days ahead. And I, I guess... When I got to where I was reading that, I, I did see that there were a lot of checkpoints. I think that there are the monthly updates that are in there to be <clears throat> turned in. So I, I, do you see what I'm talking about? Maybe Judd, who, who would yeah. be the Is that a typical? It sounds like one of those reoccurring things on my credit card that I find. And I just want to um, know if that's typical for this kind of big project. It doesn't happen. Well, the total, the total, the renewal provision is for an automatic renewal provision unless we terminate it but the absolute absolute cutoff date is December 30th 2020 so it's going to renew at the end of this calendar year for unless we terminate it and then it'll go forward that's language uh, under Georgia law you can't have a uh, you can't buy in the future commission so it put this language in there that makes it so that it could be terminated uh, for example if y'all don't want to fund it next year if you made if you made that decision you know you could terminate it and that's what that's for so we would automatically this would automatically appear on the agenda cycle a year from now so that we had this discussion well it wouldn't in the with, or, it wouldn't at the end of this year I mean a, a, probably, a year from it's a, it makes it sound like if this was approved the first week of December, this is going automatically going to be renewed at the end of 2020, well, unless we give a 30-day notice that we, yeah. we're... I could clarify that language, but up above it says that the total funding obligation is $800,000, but I can clarify that. Commissioner, it may not be a bad idea to do that. I'll do that. Make it clear some that clarification it's, that it's going there. to terminate at the end of... Uh, I'll I'll modify that language to say it's going to terminate absolutely at the end of uh to clarify that it's going to terminate absolutely on December thirty first two thousand and twenty unless this unless it's yeah uh, unless it's taken by the commission it, it seems to me it would be better no, to do it we'll do that. the opposite way no worries but if, I don't know what it, if anybody else feels that that would be, it would be better language Mr. Turner, no. look at item number eight you already have that language what page is that it's up. Uh, Eight items in the, in the same section of the document. Okay. See item eight. <clears throat> Commissioner Thornton. Yeah, this agreement shall be effective for term beginning on December 4, 2019 and running through December 31st, 2020 unless terminated early in accordance with applicable terms and conditions. The agreement may only be extended by mutual written agreement of the parties here too. But I do understand that that other thing is confusing, so I'll, I'll modify it. It's this, not a problem. This captures what what Every, yeah. what we're thinking yeah More, and we don't need that other paragraph yeah that, I can right. that, that's okay. I can take that out it's not a problem Commissioner Thornton thank you mayor um, I support this proposal um, I think that it goes back to Commissioner Neesmith's um, comment years oh, well not years ago I've only been here in months but um, when when he describes something as uh, forming, storming, norming, and performing. That was a term you used. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> storming, uh, yes. and norming, I performing. I think we are in the storming place right now, and um, this is going to move us to the norming and performing. It's, it's a risk um, always, but it, I think it's a calculated risk. <clears throat> I am... 
I'm based in my support, even though I still have some questions in my mind. But when we spend money to bring consultants in to tell us about our communities, when we spend money for folk that are not vested or don't live in our community to tell us about our community, and we question people who are lived here, raised here, are affected by, affected by the environment, I, I don't think we are giving credit to folk in our community. We should know our community, and we should um, trust the people that live here, and we should not be leery of paying them for service that we do not mind paying folk coming from out of town dressed in a suit. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is we like to think that the poorest people live in public housing, um, Bethel Homes, Broad Acres, but we have UGA graduates right here that can't get a job, and they're from this community, and they fit this criteria. So we have this stereotypical image of who is impoverished and who is trying to make it. We have some folk that have degrees that could easily become a community navigator because they know the community and they know why they have not gotten a job. So we need to kind of freshen up our thoughts on who is poor, who needs this. This is not, we, we keep trying to make this sound like uh, it's, it's just a giveaway. It's not. It is creating opportunity, and we need to um, use the experts that live here to help us th do this. Yeah, it's a risk, but it's a calculated risk. I like the fact that this is going to be monitored. I like the fact that we're going to stay engaged, but we have to start somewhere. Where The other thing that uh, Commissioner Denson said, our, our partners are so important in this endeavor. Um, the local government cannot save people. We have to work with everybody and anybody. And we may have to work with some unusual allies to make this successful. We've got to start somewhere if we really mean to address this problem. So I believe the questions that I still have, I believe that um, Tim will be available to answer them if it comes down to it. Um, I believe that we, this is bigger than 16 people. Um, we're asking them to go out and um, get us information and bring it back. But we also should be making sure those 16 navigators have the resources and the information that will help them. There, we, we should look at the 16 navigators as building a pathway to prosperity for themselves also. So if we can spend money on consultants from wherever they come from, we could invest in our own people and trust that they know this community than someone that jets in and jets out of the community. Commissioner Neesmith. Well, the analogy that I hope you will remember wasn't about um, storming, norming, and performing. It was about ready, fire, aim. <laughs> We're spending $800,000 to, to, to navigate people to programs that already exist. We're not doing anything to enhance those programs or to create new programs with this $800,000. According to Tim, we don't even have an accurate 211 list so they know where to send people. Uh, seems to me like supporting getting the 211 list updated is as important as anything. Uh, we haven't created any new programs. We have not asked and we're not assisting at this point our partners in enhancing or creating new programs. And by the way, I haven't said anything about a consultant. That's not on my mind at all. It was on mine. Okay. <laughs> um, so I would say maybe hiring 16 navigators would be the right thing to do once we do more work once we get our partners to do more work, once we support our partners in getting more opportunities in place that these navigators can point them to. Thank you. All right, um, I just want to note, um, tying together some threads that we've heard from commissioners tonight, uh, sort of considered how this expenditure may launch us into the next phase of our prosperity package work. And I think as noted in the agenda report, 
uh, as you look at the kind of emphasis on removing barriers to economic self-sufficiency and creating access to resources for residents, um, you know, this does create this web, this network, uh, by which knowledgeable individuals can connect our many residents who are not accessing existing resources, getting that connection made. Um, what I do uh, hope to see as the next step in our prosperity package is enhancement of those very resources uh, to the extent that we know that there are some cracks and some unfulfilled needs altogether. Um, so I anticipate in the next few days uh, sending out to the commission just a draft model for what our process could look like to identify that set of needs and, uh, and, and reach out to community partners and ask them to come and help us fulfill some of those needs so that there would be, upon uh, imagined passage of this action, those new components that we can make sure are, are going to fulfill workforce development, early childhood, uh, housing or health care or other kinds of needs. So. Um, be on the lookout. All right, uh, moving forward, um, item number 19 uh, is under old business. This is departmental recycling policy. Uh, Commissioner Davenport, do you want to provide any updates on this? Yes. Or? I'm almost finished um, with my CDO. Um, I've worked hard with Sherry Hines, um, Joe Dunlop with um, ACC um, Recycling, and Suki Jensen. I think we finished it today, but we just need to um, have, we just need to polish it. But um, we do have a community meeting tomorrow at 530 at 725 West Hancock. So um, if anyone wants to provide input, please feel free to come by tomorrow. All right. Commissioner Harry. Uh, thank you. I, I just have a small comment. I think there's maybe a typo on here on page 192 item. Under the history, item number nine, it says, uh, number seven talks about 2019, mm -hmm. eight talks about 2019, ten talks about 2019, but nine says in April 2018. Is that April 2018 or should it be 2019? I think it's probably 2019 if you just correct I, that. I think it's 18 because, well, no, it could have been, it could have been 19. I'll, I'll check that out. We've been just working with lettuce compost for a while, but... Okay. Uh, just for accuracy, it just seemed to be strange, strangely ordered. Sure, sure. Out of chrono out of chronological order. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll we'll, uh, we'll make sure there's not a rift in the time space continuum <coughs> in that item. I got my red pen. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to uh, item number twenty, the Western Downtown Athens Local Historic District designation and approval of associated design guidelines. Um, for, for those members of the public, there are a handful of. Um, historic district or uh, landmark designations uh, on the agenda. Uh, th this is just that Western component. Um, uh, Mentor Williams, do, do you want to provide any sort of overview of this item? Uh, well, this was, um, as uh, recounted by some of the speakers, um, this was something that was generated um, by the commission in response to uh, a request for a demolition. Um, and uh, the planning staff and the HPC were um, engaged to uh, do a study of the downtown and try to determine, uh, you know, contributing, non-contributing properties. And um, this would, um, if, if passed, <clears throat> this would require, um, you know, any reno renovations to buildings to come before the, um, to get a certificate of appropriateness. Um, so that's what's being asked here. And just as additional prelude to the conversation, I'd note that, you know, having been through, you know, creation of many local historic districts, we've seen certainly modifications in almost every case from sort of an initial proposal to, to final passage. So uh, for members of the commission, as we learned in the work session, those kind of modifications are standard operating procedure, really, as we kind of move into any local historic district finalization. So uh, any input on this item? Uh, Commissioner Link. Yeah, um, I'd just like to start by saying that um, many of our constituents have been begging for further protections of our downtown for years. Um, I hear it every day, um, and I hear it from all kinds of folks. Um, I, I hear it from folks who, who remember when, um, you know, an entire neighborhood was raised for student housing dorms to go up, and many folks associate that activity from 
40, 50 years ago with the activity that's going on now in downtown. Um, and, you know, a decade or so ago, we were able to protect the central core of downtown, which was kind of the, the merchant class um, shopping district. And as downtown changed and, and the demographics of the University of Georgia changed, the, um, the culture of downtown Athens, the culture that put downtown Athens on the map, um, the arts and the music culture, has been slowly pushed further and further west. So there's now just a couple square blocks where the activities that, that put us on the map, the, the music activities, the arts activities, there's a reason that you know, we hold our street festivals in that part of downtown for the most part, and our historic African-American business district. There's a reason we have Hot Corner Festival at Historic Hot Corner. I'm not sure how impactful that festival would be if that block were replaced with a seven, eight, nine, ten story high <coughs> luxury student housing project. And this side of downtown is being eyed by those developers. I met with one just last week who has plans in the works for 300 or so bedrooms, about five or six stories, just a couple blocks away. Um, you know, outside this currently proposed district, but it's going to have a, a significant impact on this part of downtown. Um, and, and I feel like it's our duty to protect that culture. It's part of our identity. It's who we are. Um, and I want to I want to point out that nothing about historic designation precludes churches from continuing their work in the community. In fact. If anything, I would think it would help to um, assure that that work continues because historic de de designation will prevent some of the, de the, the gentrification and the, um, I mean, right now downtown is basically becoming a homogenized district of playtime for elites. Um, all we have left is that western end. And, um, you know, 20 years ago, Angie Grass took $1,000 that her grandmother left her and started the Flickr bar. The 40 watt has been able to exist because these old buildings, these old warehouse buildings could accommodate it. The only places that continue to host live music are in this western end of downtown where we have these more industrial sized buildings. And properties are being gathered. Um, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before we see a luxury student high rise directly across the street from the 40 watt. This is the only way to, to put a stop to that. It's the only way to preserve our culture and that's what historic preservation is all about. It's not just about preserving buildings, but it's pre about preserving the culture that historically existed in that building, those buildings and the culture that is enabled by those very buildings. Um, you can't have a 40 watt club at the bottom of a student high rise or a Flickr bar or a Brown's barber shop. It just doesn't happen. I mean, the, those luxury high rise buildings are happy to leave their bottom floors blank rather than lower their rents to accommodate local businesses. We, we see that all the time. Um, so I would just implore this commission to listen to the people of this community, the people who use downtown that are not empowered by ownership of particular properties, who don't have the $2 million to drop down on a property. And, and that's what properties are going for. That's what single buildings are going for downtown. And those property taxes trickle down to the renters. Um, I think it's counterintuitive to cite the existence of new high-rise buildings within this district as a reason to deny historic designation. I, instead, I say that's all the more reason to approve it. Um, we see what can happen, and we need to preserve what little we do have left. Um, you know, this is a, a part of downtown that is friendly to diverse culture. Um, the bars in Western downtown regularly host hip hop nights and are, are very inviting to African American culture. And they're also very inviting to LGBTQ culture. We, you know, we do have a bar that's known as being the LGBTQ friendly bar. That doesn't happen on the other side of downtown. And if we get that continued student housing development on this end of downtown, 
those kind of businesses will not exist in our downtown anymore. Um, I think we have a duty to this community to preserve that diversity and to ensure that small locally owned businesses can persist and the culture that made us famous, that put us on the map, the culture that so many of us cite pride in, which is slowly being t plucked away, um, we have a duty to do what we can to preserve that. Commissioner Wright. Um, thank you. I this is a lot for us to learn right now. This um, historic districts are always challenging. The previous ones that the commission has approved have been residential. This is my first experience with it involving the property owner and yet a tenant. So there's a double number of uh, affected people. And that with the national boundary and then outside the national boundary and inside the national historical boundary. Um, we've got, I guess, a little bit of the process that I would like clarified. I'm looking at the note here that talks about, so we've got two historic district agenda items and we have two landmark designations. So can, um, can you walk me through the public hearing that is next, the December 3rd for all four of these and what processes were set up with for these? Well, and, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to call Planning Director Brad Griffin okay. here to answer some specific questions like that. Um, so if we'll just give him a second. Okay. But basically this is, you know, the run up to the actual approval of the historic district requires that public hearing. And, and so, um, okay. let Brad come well, here. And, and just if I've got the numbers right, the Western, the Western uh, downtown Athens Historic District designation is 194 pages, and this is all information that we have all need to read and, and understand to move forward. The uh, amendment to the current local historic district is 76 pages, and the two landmarks are in the 30-page range. Welcome. I, I hope that's okay, Mayor. Absolutely, yeah. Th thanks for coming, Brad. I think your question was about the process of public, pu public hearing and the process um, that it looks like we're heading yeah. into okay. for all four of these, I guess. Easiest way I can explain this to you is just try to think of them the same way you deal with if you had four rezoning items on your agenda. Each one is a separate public hearing. Each one you will call for public input. They're advertised individually. Mm -hmm. And then you'll, you'll do the Western downtown first. There will be call for public input. You'll hear that input and then you'll make a decision then you move to the next one all four of them are completely independent of each other so when we hear public input on the same day that we're supposed to vote and we're thinking you know i need more time to process the public input for my decision <clears throat> how does a hold or uh, a 30-day hold work into this I mean, you have you have the ability to hold it this item yeah to for further consideration but it doesn't kick it out like a planning um, no there are there thing. are specific hold regulations within the zoning ordinance for rezoning items right but that, that that limit your ability as to how long you can hold it <clears throat> but it's still it's very much the same i mean you know you when you have a rezoning come before you you have your public hearing the night of your vote mm -hmm. you know they get up they speak to you then you're called upon if you need more time the ordinance typically gives you the ability to hold for one cycle. I mean, you could certainly do that with these historic districts as well if you, if the group as a whole saw fit to do it. Okay. But don't, I mean, they're all four. Separate. Western is its own district. The amendment to the existing deals with three or four properties that are on the east side of the existing downtown district. Correct. And then the other two are two of the individual landmark properties that came out of the Millage Circle historic district where that district was reduced mm -hmm. and then people that were previously in that were pulled out of the proposal were given the opportunity if they wanted their individual properties considered as landmarks to work with us and do so and we ended up with two of those and again totally separate separate hearings separate votes okay because um, in my mind the previous residential historic district that we worked through which are very challenging very complicated it was coming from the property owners asking us for this. And this one seems a little bit opposite to me because it's coming from the top down versus 
from the ground up, except for the two landmarks. The landmarks are the property owners wanting this designation. Yeah, and it's it's not hold one, hold all. You can act on one, you can act on all four. It's your decision, but each one is dealt with separately. Okay, thanks. That helps. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Herrick. Uh, thank you. I have two questions. I think one is for our attorney and one is for somebody else, maybe Brad. I, I'm not sure. So. Um, Mr. Attorney, so there was some commentary at the podium about how the proposed district is not consonant with state law. Could you, you have any opinion about that? Could you comment on that? No, I, I would not want to comment now. I'll be glad to research that comment and provide a, a written response to the commission. But, uh, you know, I, at this time, I would believe that staff did the appropriate work and it was legally appropriate. I have not reviewed that matter to determine okay. that. If, but if I'll be happy would. to do that. Okay. And then the question, I think it, maybe it's for Brad. Um, how does this fit into the downtown master plan? Do you have, or does it not? Okay, I think it's it's really kind of an independent approach from from the overall master plan. I don't. It's, uh, sorry, it's I think one. it's. I think it really functions independently. I don't. I don't okay. think if you were to not approve this as a district, it negatively impacts the master plan. But I don't think it. I mean, I think it's an. But the master plan proposal. doesn't call for a historic district for downtown, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hamby. Sure. sure. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I appreciate Brad and, and staff putting this together. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm generally very supportive of of historic districts. And I, with this one, I do think there are some modifications that need to be made in order to uh, in order to to make it sort of uh, collective and make make some sense out of it. I will say this though, I, um, you know, if you are in a historic district, that won't, uh, you know, we don't. The HPC is not going to look at use. So some of the some of the things that have been mentioned, uh, you know, could still could still occur within an HPC district uh, from from that standpoint. As long as the building is is, uh, is meets the design guideline standards. So so I guess I would I would caution against using the the, the historic designation process for for trying to trying to stop some sort of use or something like that i just think i think that probably doesn't help our future historic designation processes in that way and you know and i, I certainly um, um, appreciate the folks that came down here tonight uh, several of them are property owners business owners downtown uh, they they work downtown they're not they're not part of the part of the playtime for elites but they are people that work downtown and 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 help contribute to downtown and and have made downtown uh, vibrant over the years, so so I think we need to be uh, mindful of that as well. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see what what kind of what kind of uh, district could look like with some with some modifications uh, that that do address some of the concerns that we've heard tonight. Especially, you know, for, for years I thought we also we should be talking to our state legislature when it comes to contributing and non-contributing properties. I, I just kind of feel like if you're going through the HPC process. That you got to be afforded uh, the the the, uh, the tax freeze, regardless if you're contributing or non-contributing. I mean, it's a you know it, it is a process that you go through. So, anyway, I look forward to more discussion with this and hearing from more uh, folks on this. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Link. Yeah, I agree with Commissioner Hamby. I'm <clears throat> wide open to um, tweaking this. I know that some of the comments at the podium um, suggested that it was too broad. Um, and, and I believe that staff did that for a reason, to allow this commission to kind of work with it because we wouldn't be allowed to add to what they present, but we can certainly subtract from it. And, you know, I definitely want to reconsider the non-contributing status of the Washington Street building um, that Mr. Deekle presented some clear evidence that that building sh probably should be contributing. Um, and I mean, I, I would love to sit down with Commissioner Hamby and, and take a look at this map and take a look at those contributing and non-contributing and, and work something out that makes, makes sense. All right. Thank you, everybody. We are moving on to the next item, number 21. Um, this is, as Brad referenced a couple minutes ago, the addition of uh, just a very small handful of properties to the existing downtown Athens local historic district. Um, those properties are sort of on the eastern edge of, uh, of that district. So, Commissioner Link. Yeah, I, I would like to propose that this be tabled. 
Um, I just feel like expanding the existing historic district right now is kind of muddying the water. I, I understand that Commissioner Wright is confused. I know that some folks here are also confused. There's been some confusion in the public. Um, you know, rather than expanding the existing historic district, I'd rather see us create this new western downtown hot corner historic district and take a new look at our existing downtown guidelines, which is long overdue. Um, so I would ask the mayor to remove this from the agenda. Anybody else? Commissioner any? Davenport? Yeah, I, was, uh, I would like to support um, Commissioner Link's idea to um, remove it from the agenda. I heard a lot of um, a lot of responses from the people at First and Me who were who were opposed to this and they just had a lot of general questions and um because it was uh, this was a very lengthy packet to to read and understand that i was not able to um speak with staff and to convey some of their concerns so i would love to take this off as well mr hamby yeah i would agree right. with that i think it does it yeah. does muddy the waters a bit with the with the other one with the other one there and um and uh, as as we've seen, there's opportunities to to revisit this um, down the line. So, I agree. Yeah. All right, moving on to uh, the first of the two landmark properties. Uh, item number twenty two is the Gannon House. Commissioner uh, Hamby. Sure, I'll be glad to talk about this. Uh, I think these next two are actually in my district uh, on that side of uh, Millage Circle. It's shared with uh, Commissioner Edwards and myself. And uh, I think this person who signed up for this landmark historic district is, is in favor of it. So I will uh, reach out to him to make sure. Um, but I'm almost certain that they are. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Commissioner. Any more about the Gannon House? All right, moving on to Grayside. Number 23. I'd like Mr. to comment Hamby. on, if you don't mind, comment on this one as well. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is also uh, uh, the, the Waters House. And John Waters, uh, I'm glad to see this happening uh, because John Waters um, develop, helped develop our, our statewide uh, historic mm -hmm. preservation sort of, it's not an ordinance, what would that be uh, for state? Uh, Legislation. Yeah, there, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Edwards. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a it's a it's a good vote and it's a good honor for John Waters um, and for helping create not only the statewide one but also is very helpful on some on some local um, historic designation ordinances as well and has been very helpful in addressing a lot of questions to this board over the years and um, I'm I'm glad this is happening so. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Hamby. Uh, my, my assignment to everybody before we move on to number 24 is you have to go home tonight and think of a name for your own home because uh, <laughs> just like with these two, it deserves some nomenclature. Um, I think Commissioner Harrod's already taken Animal House, so maybe that's... <laughs> we, we, we know about the, the wilds of his backyard. Uh, all right, item number 24 is our annual application to the Georgia Department of Transportation for the LMIG funds or uh, local maintenance improvement grant. And so you see the total dollar amount as well as the anticipated streets that would be um, that would be maintained. So any questions about this item? Commissioner Denson? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, if we were to, uh, if this was successful, what, what's the timeline we'd look at actually having work done on these streets? So good question. So... Uh, we have transitioned from a fiscal year paving program to a calendar year uh, because of you just don't pave during freezing temperatures. So the paving, and, and I appreciate the question, Commissioner. So those streets that are part of attachment one, you know, GDOT requires us to, to put some streets down, but they understand that we're still, uh, you know, we've converted from a manual assessment of road condition to automated, and we'll be able to project out for five years, hopefully, what the needs are. And so in the spring, the uh, recommended list of roads would be brought back to you. Um, it, you know, you, if we submit the element ap application each year, knock on wood, it's, it's been approved. And then GDOT understands that we come back in the spring after meeting with you and they amend uh, what, what they need to. So you, they'll have another discussion point. Mm -hmm. We'll have some recommendations in the spring. Um, the, uh, the contract. You know that will also be approved by y'all and then uh the paving would commence in the spring and go through up until october of next year so so this list here is 
kind of like just like a draft for us to yes to it, work from. Yeah, it's not you're not. We're going to be coming back to amend that list with informed recommendations. Okay, let's just let's just make sure that those uh, Homewood Hill streets stay on there, then. <laughs> Commissioner Neesmith. Smith. Let's see how they do. That. Yeah, and some of those Forest Heights streets that need to be paved and haven't been need to be on it. That's what I'm wondering about. How does this relate to? Uh, maybe you explained it, but I didn't understand it. Relate to our to our paving list that we approve uh, in the springtime. That this That's this a, this is just the. Um, Formality that we have to do in order to get the LMIG funds. We have to, you oh, have okay. to formally approve the application, and GDOT asked for some road segments okay. to be so, included. So these streets, in, in effect, get added to whatever we have financing for. These are placeholders right now, and uh, we'll come back in the but, spring. But but we'll have a much larger list in the spring. Yes. Right. Okay. Commissioner Harry. I, I mean, I guess the obvious question then is, why not just put the Put the roads that are on our list for paving on our application. Why? Because why? we're still finalizing that list. Um, you know, we went, we went, we've converted to a new, um, a more automated road assessment mm -hmm. um, system, and we need to finalize those recommendations. And when will that be done by? Uh, it'll, it'll come back to you in the spring. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But when? Brings four months long. Yes, yes. Um, Three months long. I think it's usually in March, um, okay. but, but I can find out for sure. I mean, I guess my issue is that there may be some streets on this list that are just quote-unquote placeholders that somebody in the public is going to see their street on here, think it's going to get repaved, and then if it's not on the final list, and vice versa. that creates a problem because you now created expectations that we may not be meeting. So I really wish we would get away from the using streets as just placeholders unless we're absolutely positively 100 percent certain that they're going to get repaved in the next 12 month cycle i understand well th these aren't just arbitrary streets and these have a very good chance of making the list um it's not as to commissioner neesmith's point it's not a comprehensive list there'll be more mm -hmm. added to it I, and I, I, I hear what you're saying for though. me there's a difference between a very good chance and an absolute chance i got you we want to take this to vegas sir all right. Point Any table. other questions on 24? All right. Uh, moving on to 25, which is uh, acquisition of computer software for finance and human resources. This is a sort of long anticipated upgrade of some software to uh, allow for greater functionality within those departments. Um, Manager Williams, do you want to highlight any of the opportunities that this creates? Well, um, <coughs> I mean, it's, it's a long agenda packet. If you haven't had a chance to read it, uh, we've been using Eden since 07, and it's a Tyler product that's no longer supported and um, or, or will be phased out. And this is some of our core functions, business functions with finance and HR, you know, payroll, accounts receivable, so on and so forth. So we're working with Tyler to, um, uh, well, we, we went through an RFP process, uh, and Tyler was selected, and this is moving that forward. Commissioner Neesmith. In the uh, agenda of use meeting that we had, um, I expressed, well, first of all, I've had some, I've witnessed and been a part of several uh, conversions to new ERP packages, which is what this is. And the basic experience is it always costs a whole lot more and takes a whole lot more time and has much more effect on the culture. The, the conversion process than, than anyone ever anticipates. I said, I'm concerned about whether or not we'll have the right project management in place. These kinds of implementations take at least one full-time person leading the effort. Uh, whether we have funded the training that's going to be required and that our, 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 our plan includes a pilot and a phased implementation. <clears throat> So I think it's a good idea for us to do this. I'm just concerned that we have uh, underestimated the scope and the cost that's going to be associated with it. I don't know quite what to do about that except raise my flag and wave it loudly. Um, that's what I have to say about it. So, and, and I did uh, mean to follow up, and I'll, I'll share this information with y'all. I did get some more detailed information in your earlier questions. And the project manager is going to be Eric Griffin, who is our treasurer. And um, he was the obvious choice because of his attention to detail. 
He's been a leading protagonist for a new system, so he understands what they do. Uh, he's been to the Munis Conference last year and has performed a deep dive into the program's capabilities. Uh, he's organized all the teams for the various departments that are involved, um, and he's, he's solicited questions and gave them answers. Um, he's also worked with Munis regarding detailed pricing for the data conversion, implementation, and training. Um, and he's worked on contract review with attorney and IT. So he's well suited to help oversee that. Uh, and I think another question you'd ask is what were the data conversion costs and are they in the figure that you're being quoted and the answer is yes. Uh, the data conversion costs are approximately $400,000 and I can give you a breakout of those costs. I'll give the entire mayor and commission a breakout of those. Well, without getting too deep in the woods, the, the other issue that always comes up is these systems feed other systems that you, you management may not even be aware of that are on people's desks or in department computers. And those have to be identified, and the conversion of those interfaces need to be taken on. And that's not insignificant. E even identifying them is difficult, and converting them is, is not a trivial thing. But what I've seen, even at our local college, is that the conversion happens and suddenly departmental systems don't work because they're not getting the data that they have to have in order to in order to operate. Okay. I will run that down, Commissioner. More bits and bytes, Commissioner Link. Um, yeah. I, um, my comment isn't necessarily on this, but I just want to mention that our auditor has asked for new software, so I hope that we will consider that. Apparently. Um, there's some kind of industry standard software out there that will greatly, greatly help her do her job. So I, I just want to put that yeah, out there. That. Commissioner Nee Smith. I've asked a series of questions of the auditor before we approve this. I have not received a response. I, I need to be certain, first of all, there is no industry standard for this. There's one that's used, and she's in it, calling it an industry standard, and they call themselves an industry standard, but that doesn't make it so. Um, it might be a great solution. I don't know. I don't know how, how much involvement has been done with our IT department. I'm very uncomfortable with uh, any department director picking their software without a lot of consulting and a lot of investigation by the IT department, uh, without their understanding of what the implications of the software are and what the level of support is there is going to be to support it. And without them looking at the functional requirements, I haven't seen any functional requirements. I doubt there are any that have been formulated. Uh, I have a difficult time supporting any software selection based on what I've seen. I, I know our uh, IT department has been engaged, and so I'll certainly make sure that all members of the commission have a copy of their responses to this question. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Denson. And, and this might be slightly out of line. I think I just I missed you before you went, but I, I was going to suggest that we put item 24, the G.L. MIG application, on the consent agenda. I agree. I'd kind of like to wait and see. I, 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 I'm sorry. I need just want a little more information about the red list. Yeah. Okay. If you don't mind. I mean, it just. Okay. Moving on. We, of course, uh, had a lengthy discussion at our work session uh, about the uh, West Broad intersection. And we see the uh, options uh, highlighted here uh, within this agenda report, but the recommended option as well as some of the alternates. Uh, certainly be interested in hearing um, additional thoughts from commissioners. As at the work session, there was some question of whether we wanted to take a slightly different approach, um, potentially the, the one that would have really kind of created a, a direct link to um, Plaza at the roundabout. Commissioner Link? Yeah. Um it became pretty clear that um, uh, residents of the plaza had not been engaged throughout the public input process. Um, the plaza is outside that West Broad study area, so I don't believe there was an outreach to them. Um, they did get um, notified by our own staff, TPW, before um, Thursday night's meeting last week. So I attended Thursday night's meeting. Also, folks on Hodgson were at that meeting. Um, I attended Thursday night's meeting and was able to um, get some input from folks who actually live on that street that would m be most impacted by this. Um, and, and then on Sunday, I went out and knocked on some doors on the plaza. There are some older residents who've lived there forever. There are some um, brand new young families um, who are too busy to get out on a Thursday night. They have kids and stuff. Um, 
And um, it appears that option 1A is is the option that, that, that seems to be most favored. And, and the more I look at it, the more I am completely all in on this option. Um, folks, are they don't want to see their street move. They, they, they don't want to see the pattern, the traditional historic pattern of their street move. Um, option 1A still allows access into the plaza. Um, it still allows egress out of it. Um, there is some concern that um, that more traffic would be funneled up Hancock, which I, I'd like to propose a CDO along with this that would um, ask staff to do some traffic studies so we can look towards spending the rest of that Tease Bloss money on some serious traffic calming in this neighborhood as well as in the uh, Rock Springs neighborhood across the street. Um, you know, that, that Billups intersection on Hancock sees crashes on the reg. Um, folks come speeding down Hancock if they get that green light. Um, there's only a sidewalk on only one side of Hancock. I don't know if anybody's done any walking over there, but it's, it's really scary to cross it, and there is only one sidewalk on one side. Um, the plaza has the, the flashing your speed signs for traffic coming, but they don't seem to really work. Um, you know, there's, it still enables people to go really fast on, down a wide open street. Um, the Glen Haven Inman intersection is a <clears throat> big fat mess, and the, the fear is is that if people miss that access to the plaza, they'll go up Hancock and then have to work their way through that Glen Haven Inman intersection, um, which seriously needs a four-way stop. I've, I'll admit it. I've almost run that stop sign before. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I like option 1A, and I think it, it maintains the familiarity, um, but still allows access. And, and it's, you know, I sat down in folks' living rooms and on their front porches, and there seemed to be some pretty serious consensus. Um, this, the user group recommended option, which basically, like, cuts off the end of the plaza to make it do a little, little jig around the barber shop. Um, folks are scared of that because that leaves a vacant, empty space. Um, there's no guarantee that anything will ever happen in that vacant, empty space. And right now, folks do have concerns about um, the, the vacant, wooded property along the sidewalk. There's often a lot of trash and evidence of seedy activity. Um, and I know there was some expression of support for number six the big, highly engineered project. Um, I had some lengthy conversation with Frank Stevens, um, and he, he revealed you know, how huge that project is. Um, in order to reconfigure and repipe the stream to accommodate reconfiguring the plaza, you would have to take those two Hodgson Avenue properties. And it's not just taking their backyards. Um, the engineering of the whole project would likely compromise the foundations of those homes. So those would be, you know, existing fairly new, nice single-family homes that would force, a, you know, two families to move and um, have to probably rebuild new homes on those lots. Um, you know, it's just a super expensive, highly engineered project that wouldn't leave any money left over for what the community really, really wants, which is traffic coming. Quite frankly, you know, the majority of folks in this community, they could care less if the intersection changes as long as they get some traffic coming in their neighborhoods. And I, I'd ask the mayor possibly to assign a reconsideration of our neighborhood traffic management standards um, because so many of these roads don't meet one of the two, either volume or speed standards. But they'll, well, many of them meet the speed standard, but they don't meet the volume one. Or, um, and these are roads that weren't necessarily designed for even 25 mile an hour speed limits. They, these, you know, this is a neighborhood that was built before most people had cars. Um, so, I, you know, I feel very strongly that those speed and volume standards should be altered for neighborhoods where you have what are considered substandard streets and where you have um, homes that are right up on the curb. I mean, many of these streets, there's really no room to even put in a sidewalk. So it's essential that we get those traffic calming mechanisms so these can be truly shared neighborhood streets. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm 
feel very strongly about option 1A. I know there is one resident of the plaza here. I don't know if he missed the public input session, but um, I'm sure we'll hear from more of them. Um, uh, some of these folks don't do email, though, so I have some notes I can share with you. <laughs> no, if you have some specific input from folks, I think it'd be helpful for commissioners okay. to see. Commissioner uh, Neesmith. Well, I just want to thank you, Commissioner uh, Link, for getting out there and doing the footwork and getting <laughs> that kind of input. That's very helpful. And you make an excellent point about our our traffic calming standards, applying them to streets that were designed in the horse and buggy days. And I think that's right there is, is, is something that we should look at uh, in those standards and take into consideration those street designs as well as the more modern ones. So thank you for that. Commissioner Wright. Um, <clears throat> the quarter committee met today and we brought up the very same thing about the idea of recommending that the traffic neighborhood traffic calming management yeah. thing whatever we have on that be reviewed because it's uh, maybe outdated so it's good to hear everybody thinking about that and um, I too appreciate the work that you've done to summarize the feedback because I had left liking six from the work session option uh, but knowing and seeing how it it canters over into those properties and the terrain there is uh, totally different. Um, can, can we learn, uh, this one is time sensitive, isn't it? For us to get this in to GDOT for the GDOT money to help us out with the roundabout? It is, they require that their complete concept design report be completed, submitted prior to March 1st. So we really need a decision in December. Okay. Um, that, I've got a couple sorry. folks, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I still have to say, I, I mean, I lean, I guess I, I have a question on, on number six, proposal six, because this didn't come up during our work session. Is, uh, manager, is, is, is that true that if we were to do that, we're going to have those Hodgson properties are going to have to be condemned well, or taken there well, there? you know, it, it definitely is going to impact more and require more right of way just by the alignment of it. No, I mean, I, I definitely understand that just seeing the alignment, but I guess the, the fact that the, those, those lots won't be livable, is that, or, that's, or will the properties be compromised? That's yeah. The question to the structurally compromise. No, these are conceptual designs. I don't, I, I don't know if I can answer that. right. Okay. Now. I mean, if we could get, uh, that opinion from, uh, director Stevens, I guess, and out to the entire commission to get a, a better idea of that. Um, I'd like to build it. I think at the least we'd have to take the eastern half of the property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part. Yeah, that part I saw. I just, I think it's uh, it's another extreme to tell people they have to leave their homes and can you know. Um, cause if we can do this, I mean, I want us to be able to have the best option here, not just for 2019, but the best option for 2069. You know, and if we're talking about Something that's going to be slightly more expensive, but is going to be by far the best option for pedestrians and also for motorists uh, going forward. I mean, that's the option I want. And I, I really feel like the in this situation, at least, with this corridor, one of the best ways for us to limit and, and do traffic calming is to make this intersect section actually efficient and effective. Like we all know this intersection is not, and I think all of us probably intentionally avoid it all the time and take cut through streets and those other other areas. I think if we can actually make this intersection work, so that's how we're going to be able to cut down all the calming, uh, the traffic calming, and put that in place for all these other streets. Um, and so I just wanted to have the what's going to be the most efficient to get the automobiles through the for the longest period of time. And also is going to be the safest for the pedestrians. And from what we were told during the work session, that would be option six. But I would like to have uh, yeah a little more information on what the impact is going to be there to those property owners on uh, on Hodgson. Commissioner Hamby, sure. I'd just like to ask about the the money uh, real quick uh, because I know we learned at the at the work session that this project wouldn't be done until 2024, which probably means 2034, maybe. But uh, um, but I think you see where I'm going on this. We, we're going we're gonna to commit this year's T-SPLOS dollars to a project that will happen in 2024 
uh, that could possibly also, I know, it, I know it's not a certainty, but could possibly also have some t splice projects associated with it. So what I'm, what I'm asking is, and this kind of leads into what Commissioner Link was asking about, and I remember uh, Commissioner Thornton was on the West Broad Study Committee, and how we can get more of those projects that were impacting the roads around there done. So do we have to put on here, I know we got to put, we're going to commit $3 million to it. We don't necessarily have to commit, commit to where it's coming from maybe, or, or maybe even just put it as a T-splice project without, you see where I'm going with this? I'm trying to open up the door for more opportunities within the West Broad area uh, to meet some of the needs there as well. Well, um, you know, we'll have to have an agreement with GDOT at some point committing to those funds, you know, so yeah. that they know that we're serious and committed. Uh, I don't believe that you have to, I don't believe, I have to go look at this, we have to look at the contract with the attorney, that you have to specify the source. Right. You just have to be good for the money. That would be good. And I, because I, I, I do see this, I don't, you know, this is in the West Broad area, but it's more of a community type. Uh, I mean, this road is heavily traveled. I mean, it's, it's just one of the main thoroughfares into, into downtown and out of downtown. So it's not just utilized by the folks in, in West Broad. And just as though we're looking at, uh, uh, a lot of Lexington Road dollars or Atlanta Highway dollars or Prince Avenue dollars, a lot of those can be specific specific projects designed specifically for a lot of the residents along there. So um, anyway, I'm just trying to think outside the box a little bit and not, not necessarily commit ourselves to where the, the – commit the funds but not designate <coughs> where they would be coming from. I've got a couple other commissioners, but, but I will note that just looking at that timeline – uh, it's very possible that we'll have another approved t plus mm -hmm. referendum by the time the construction would happen as well. Um, Commissioner Herod was next. Thank you. Um, so uh, I would just like to follow up on what Commissioner Denson said, and I, I agree with him. I would like to get an answer from the manager about the specifics of those couple of properties. But I mean, this is a, a, an incredibly traveled thoroughfare and I think we need to be planning for the next half century or longer. Mm -hmm. Traffic is not going to get, it's not going to reduce out there. It's only going to get heavier as we go through the decades. I understand that this project, option number six, is a bit more expensive than some of the others, but um, I'm willing to spend the money to do this the right way rather than to put a Band-Aid on this and to me, in terms of safety for people in vehicles and for pedestrians, option six, the consultant told us it's the superior de mm -hmm. design. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but over 50 to 75 or 100 years or whatever this is going to be out there, it's going to outlast me. It's going to outlast anybody in this room, I suspect. Um, then I think... Um, assuming that there are no unintended consequences that we're not aware of yet, that option six is the superior one. And my understanding from some of the feedback on uh, the meeting last Thursday, a lot of people at that meeting really liked option six. So I would be interested in getting the public comments that our staff collected. Commissioner Thornton. I, um, I, did, I missed the uh, uh, planning meeting, but I did go... Uh, to HT Edwards on Thursday and got a a briefing on the different options and my own well I, I think it should whatever we did well let's say it's the main third way but I just wanted to make sure and I did mention this to Commissioner Link is that there is not that we make sure that Han Hancock going is not collateral there's no collateral damage there mm -hmm. that is a very small street um and if that circles around i could see congestion um that used to be a uh pretty much uh an african american neighborhood it's it's very gentrified it's very integrated now so i can't address you know, uh, people of color in that area, but still the st safety and congestion would um, 
be a concern no matter who lived over there. I am torn between one and six, so I'll wait until we get the other information. But whatever ever, uh, option we pick, I, I really would like to hear to make sure that Hancock is not um, experiencing any negativity with ever, either option. Commissioner Edwards? I, uh, I'm also in favor of, of option six. Uh, the consultant said it was a superior design. It appears to be the superior design. I'd like to get more information about the cost estimates associated with the concept and what that might look like to repipe that stream. But, but uh, I think my colleagues' points are well taken that, that this, this is going to be a, a capstone project for this commission. This is a main entrance thoroughfare of this community. And when I look at option six, it, it appears to be the most logical, beautiful, superior design. So I, I would like to uh, explore that route as much as, well, as much as possible so we get it right. Thanks. Commissioner Link. Yeah, um, I just want to point out that option six does look really good on paper. But I want to invite everybody to go ahead and, and hang out down there, walk that stretch of the plaza, and recognize that all of those trees would be taken out. Um, Water oaks. These houses on Hodgson would have no trees obscuring their view from the plaza, which the plaza, you know, gets significant traffic. So this would be a street going directly through the backyards of a couple of in-town single-family homes, which are pretty valuable and few and far between these days. And also, I just, I just can't support piping a stream. Um, believe it or not, there's quite, this is a pretty significant wildlife corridor. I watched an eight-point buck cross the street on the plaza right around here a couple years ago. Um, I know the folks who live in the last house on the plaza, and they, they get deer in their yard. Um, I mean, I don't know if we want to encourage urban wildlife, but um, I certainly support the, the existence of mature trees, um, and, and it certainly cools the, that area of the neighborhood. Um, the folks who live in that last house hardly ever have to run their air conditioning because there's a beautiful tree canopy in that area. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, it does look beautiful on paper, but I, I, I invite folks to get on the ground and walk around and understand that that terrain down there would be completely defoliated. And um, I, I'm going to be reaching out to you, Owen, to ask them to submit a, an opinion on the impact on that stream. I think some people may be down there looking for that eight-point buck. <laughs> it was beautiful. I was amazed. You know, yeah. It was like noon on a weekday yeah. afternoon or something. Oh, Long-standing yeah. nonprofit in our town is uh, quality deer management, and uh, oh, maybe they can God. alert us to when uh, black powder season starts. So, All right. More information yeah. will be coming from staff, certainly, and uh, potentially from our consultant about uh, the, the nature of these, uh, these plans and what some of the budgetary opportunities might be. Um, uh, moving on to item number 27, uh, this is on your agenda as title only, uh, as I referenced earlier uh, with item number six, this is sort of a natural set of activities that happen after a successful passage of SPLOST. Um, Manager Williams, you could just talk a little bit about sort of where we go with um, not only the SPLOST budget and program administration, but project management and professional services as well. Sure, sure. Well, as the mayor pointed out, um, this is um, a, a natural agenda item to come forward after successful passage of the SPLOST. It was done in 2011. It was done with T-SPLOST. Um, certainly with T-SPLOST, we heard uh, from the commission, you know, an urgency to get some projects done and get project delivery moving. Um, and so um, there was a, the T-SPLOST contract was awarded to Jacobs. Um, what we're proposing in this agenda item uh, is a hybrid of um, extending their contract, but also uh, hiring a um, ACC Gov employee as a project manager. If you didn't know, um, many of the employees in the SPOST office are ACC Gov employees. Uh, 
uh, the folks that do a lot of the accounting and, and whatnot. And then we have the Jacobs res um, engineers who provide the program and project management services. So in the uh, agenda item that you have there, you can see how those costs are split up. And of course, they're allocated across the various projects. Um, um, in talking to Jacobs, um, they have agreed to lower their multiplier from what it was for the 2011 TSPLOS contracts, uh, which would give us a projected savings of about $850,000 uh, over what we would have paid had we kept the same multiplier. Um, so there is a reduction, um, and the costs are, um, you know, roughly 3%, which is about an industry standard. But there are other options, too. Um, it just depends on what y'all would like to do. Commissioner Hamby? Sure. Uh, I appreciate it, Mayor. And I, I do notice on here that one of the other options is also also sending this out to RFP. And and I would, I would, um, I, w I guess I would maybe argue for that. And it's not, uh, and because I'm arguing for it doesn't mean I'm arguing against Jacobs or, 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 or the work that they've done. Uh, I just think that um, they've, they've been helping us for since 2005. Um, and, and maybe even longer than that, because Jordan Jones and Goulding used, Jacobs used to be Jordan Jones and Goulding, and, and they also did a lot of work for us in the past as well. Uh, and 2005 was, was uh, a long time ago. I would be curious in sending out the RFP, which Jacobs could answer to as well and put a proposal in, uh, certainly, and I would encourage that. But I, I just think it would be incumbent upon, uh, upon this body to 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 open the doors to see to see uh, what else may be out there uh, that that we could consider could consider uh, and in, introduce us. It may be that we find that Jacobs is is the best thing uh, going, uh, but there also may be some new uh, new. Uh, 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 we may get introduced to some new procedure for for something that that has a new model for how we manage our, our splice projects and, and, and get them moving. And so I'd, 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 be, I'd be inclined to say let's, let's go in the RFP direction and see, see what happens. Manager Williams, j just in terms of pursuit of an RFP uh, to give some assurance that current projects underway would kind of reach fruition, could you talk a little bit about how current activities would dovetail into an RFP? Sure. Um, well, um, you, you know, I think there would, if you, we wanted to continue to move these projects forward, and certainly the big three uh, that was prioritized, uh, there would need to be uh, some form of contract extension. I hadn't mentioned this to the attorney. Um, it was noted in the agenda item that there is a 30-day, you could cancel the contract within 30 days. So it could be, and, we, and Judd and I, uh, to give him the opportunity to, to review that concept, it could be that you approve it and then if you want to go to RFP, we, we um, communicate with Jacobs and say this is the intent. We want to continue these services, and then we would come back to you with a projected timeline for the RFP uh, for your consumption. Thank you. Commissioner Link? Yeah, um, I am also interested in exploring other options regarding SPLOST. Um, on the audit committee, we've had some discussion of, of possibly um, putting SPLOST office on the audit work plan for the coming year. Um, this is an office that's been in action for 25 years and at this point has seen about a half a billion dollars of taxpayer do money go through and it'll be about three quarters of a billion if, you know, once SPLOST 2020 goes through there and they've, they've never seen an audit. So I'm wondering, I don't, I'd like to talk to Commissioner Hamby about this some, you know, I mean, maybe we could talk about a, temp, a slight extension of the contract and, you know, it, with the possibility that that audit would happen and see what kind of efficiencies or inefficiencies might be out there, um, you know, what kind of processes we might want to recommend changing. Um, you know, it's, it's like Commissioner Amby said, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a long time. Things change. Um, so I, I would like to explore other options and, you know, I, I really would like to see an, an in-depth analysis of how this office functions and, and what our opportunities are. Commissioner Edwards. I, uh, 
I also don't see the harm in putting out an RFP for other companies to compete for this contract with government. Um, since Jacobs has been with us for 2005 at least, that's 14 years, and it uh, makes sense to me to put it out there again and see, see what else is out there. Um, when it comes to auditing, I look forward to discussion, the audit committee. Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess, first I do want to say I, I, I like the, uh, the hybrid model, as mm -hmm. the manager put it, of creating the ACC employee mm -hmm. project administrator. I think that's something that's needed to happen. That would, that would be a good step. Um, I do have a question. When was, if ever, uh, the, the request for proposals for SPLOST office? So here at International, since 1994, there has been, um, we've, we've used a professional services contract with, um, for program and project management. And here International was selected by the Mayor and Commission in 1994. They served until 2005, at which time, 2004, 2005, when the actual RFP went back out. And then Jacobs was selected. And so um, we got to the 2011 program. So that, you know, that was SPOS 2005. Mm -hmm. And then 2011, the Marion Commission adopted it by ordinance. And then the T SPOS was by ordinance. So okay. it's been since, as Commissioner Edwards pointed out, 2005. Okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, I have to agree with everyone. I see only uh, positives coming out of us opening this up for request for pos proposals. Um, yeah, I don't see why we wouldn't at least take that step. Commissioner Wright. Um, we're talking about t -SPLOS, but I kind of want to go back to the roundabout, if I might ask if the t -SPLOST Oversight Committee has been involved in that roundabout discussion, and, and if there would be time for us to get their feedback. Is that appropriate or uh, possible? And, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't notice that in the agenda report. Is the I didn't see so, the committee. Well, the t -SPLOST Oversight Committee really – the SPLOS oversight committees are not to really be a user group or vet okay. designs. It's to answer the very simple question, does this fit the project description? Okay. Thanks. I, I just need that reminder. I think I got But they have right. they have looked at it and, and answered okay. that question. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. I'd, Link? I'd suggest we get an official word from Athens in motion about it. I mean, we have this transportation committee. Let's yeah. put them to work. Uh, moving forward again to the um, professional services contract, Commissioner mm -hmm. Neesmith. Well, I have to jump back just a little bit. I don't think we need Athens in motion to look at this. We've got it before us. It's gone through a process. We don't need to kick it back. Something that didn't exist before we started talking about this. So I, I don't. I don't. I understand your the reasons, uh, Commissioner Link, but I don't think we need to do that. I think we're here. So you can go on now with the rest of the agenda. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Lee Smith. I appreciate it. Uh, any uh, any other thoughts about the professional services contract? I, I will say uh, I'm very much in favor of putting this out for RFP. You know, if you look at other layers of government, federal government, you know, there's sort of a recurrent process, uh, kind of even in military applications, just to ensure we're sort of getting the crew that can best deliver results. Um, and, and that, you know, I'll say isn't always the crew that is the cheapest to the penny, but it's the crew that's the best performing. And, and so performance is, is very critical here. And so I think that would be certainly a strong element of what we would bake into the RFP. The, the other thing that I would recommend in terms of analysis of our process is reaching out to the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia and the Institute of Government. Um, certainly the SPLOS process is one that we see throughout the state, and I think they've got great familiarity with what the best practices are within that arena. And so uh, I'd, I'd recommend that as sort of a, a microscope through which we could make sure that we're using the best SPLOS process possible. Commissioner yeah, I, want, I want to support that. I think that, that uh, any issues that we have seen or perceive or wonder about in our SPLOS operations uh, have a lot more to do with process than they do with principals, uh, those that are doing it. Uh, I, I have no objection to us doing an RFP. 
Um, but uh, I think as a part of an RFP or before an RFP, we need to do what you said. Let's look at our let's look at best practices for managing SPOS projects and see if what we can implement. All right, I'll, I'll certainly Manager Williams. No, so so uh, we'll look at. Uh, I'll, I'll get with the attorney and we'll look at uh, what that process might look like and communicate with y'all. And and I, and I just want to reiterate something I thought I heard and I, I, I bet is the consensus and that is uh, th this is something that y'all feel is a healthy step. Certainly not a referendum on any performance or any services that we've been provided. Um, by Jacobs, and uh, they've done a good job. Keith and Derek both have do a really good job. Absolutely. All right. Uh, item number 28 is um, a tool that's been uh, under development for a couple of years from uh, the auditor. It's a risk assessment tool, a sort of way of analyzing the nature of our departments for prospective audit. Um, uh, auditor Maddox, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Thank you, Mayor. Several months ago, members of the audit committee expressed interest in a different approach to selecting audits. And the risk assessment is a subjective approach that allows us to first send out a questionnaire to departments to ask questions about their operations, their staffing, their levels, their budgeting, and whatnot. And that information that we receive, the, the committee will learn real challenges, challenges the department face, and they are able to make decisions, um, audit decisions for annual work plans. Great. Any questions about that? I'm uh, I'll just Commissioner offer Link. some commentary. Um, on the audit committee, you know, we're, we're at a point now where we're going to be coming up with a new work plan for the coming year. Um, and it's become clear that, you know, audits have been chosen traditionally kind of based on gut instinct and hearsay. Um, so this gives us a quantitative tool. <coughs> Um, you know, there's something to be said from like general input and, um, but this gives us a, a quantitative tool to, to, um, see what, what the risks are in particular departments and, and help us help guide our decisions. Um, and you know, it, it had been brought up before in the committee a couple of years back and the committee met pretty infrequently back then. Um, so they didn't seem to move it, but somehow it fizzled. I wasn't on the committee then. Um. But yeah, we're we're all pretty. I, I feel like we're pretty excited about having this tool, so we can help guide us in our decision making. Um, so I, I'd like to see it put on consent. Commissioner Wright, they had their hand up first. Oh. I, I also uh, want to move for it and putting this item on consent. Um, I do not know the rate or how things were done before I got on the commission. And we've had some glitches here and there. But for the work that we have produced, I think that's what we need to be moving forward to. We, got, we have to get to product, to delivery, uh, outcome. And I think this uh, assessment tool is one step closer. Again, I don't know what or why or why things happened or didn't happen before. Um, but it is very clear to me that uh, we are heading in the right direction and not putting it on consent for more discussion does not move us forward like we're trying to go. So for everybody that's been supportive and working on this, and I want to uh, commend um, Auditor Maddox for doing such a good job, or uh, and I want to, <clears throat> and even our committee, I think there's been some positive stuff that's been shared, and we just need to move forward. We just need to move forward. Commissioner Harry. Thank you. I am not interested in putting it on consent because I got a whole bunch of questions. Um, so I'm looking at the list of questions at the back of this document, so. and a lot of these seem to be. Well, first of all, these are, a lot of these seem to be questions that fall under the purview of the manager's office rather than as a, as a whole. Um, and so, you know, much as I um, get irritated when the manager's office seems to get into our lane, I'm not sure that we necessarily need to be getting into the manager's lane either. Um, but some of these questions um, that would be asked of individual 
departments, I'm not sure that those departments, the, the, a lot of these are questions about financial activities, which is really not what the internal op auditor's office is supposed to be doing, at least not in terms of my understanding. I mean, we have a whole financial department that is looking out for these kinds of things. The internal auditor's office is supposed to be looking at how departments operate in terms of functionality, not in terms of fiscal responsibility, in my opinion. Um, and so there's a bunch of questions here that I'm not sure. I mean, there, there's some questions about, please consider the amount of exposure or reputational risk a negative occurrence would have on the department if reported in the media. This would include fraud, waste, or abuse in the department, vis visibility of the department, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. Um, I mean, that, that to me is the manager, the manager's office's job to look after that, not down at the department head level. I'm not sure um, how, you know, if there were some kind of financial malfeasance taking place in a particular department, and I'm certainly not suggesting that there <coughs> is because I think we have great staff, but since these uh, are to be put into place as safeguards, um, I'm not sure that uh, asking the the people in the department themselves these kinds of questions is the appropriate level to be asking those kinds of questions. Um, and then in terms of um, you know choosing which departments to audit, that's always been a decision of the Mayor and Commission, not the Audit Committee. Commissioner Wright? Um, yeah, this I, I can speak to uh, the previous discussion, I was the chair of the audit committee and we did meet regularly uh, back then and we had the risk assessment was approved as a work plan topic. And then it was put on hold because the time that was spent in the audit committee and with the operational analysis department on the risk assessment was taking away from the time to do the audits. And so we had put it on hold so that the audits could be the focus. Um, and then when it was time to do a new work plan and pick a new uh, audit to be uh, undertaken by the, by the department, that the risk assessment would come back. But um, I think uh, a point of uh, one of our meetings in March, the audit committee, the discussion was happening about the new work plan and we had a motion and it was uh, agreed by that motion and vote to uh, cease the discussion of the 2019 work plan until the current work plan was audits were complete and i kind of feel we might be in that same point now because the current work plans of uh, that were voted on january 2018 uh, those, um, just one of those three have been completed. And then we added animal services. I think that's the new name of that department. We added that. So that's um, four audits that are currently in the department. And I think that I just had a, a, a disagreement on continuing to talk about the risk assessment for making a new work plan. and its ability to interfere with the focus of the current audit. So I just wanted to share that was why we put it on hold before. And I feel like um, the bulk of uh, some of the committee discussions have been about the assessment tool, how much time each department would be taking. And it's coming forward in the work plan. I didn't realize that that was part of what we decided, that all the departments would be doing this so it's, it seems to me like the whole mayor and commission should be involved in what sort of time commitment we're asking the staff, the whole staff to do, it, it, and especially since we're, we're not ready to do a new audit to decide for the work plan. So I just wanted to capture that part of it too because you weren't sure why the risk assessment had been put table before. So essentially, Commissioner, you're recommending deprioritizing this and prioritizing those, those audit completions? The focus of finishing the audits, um, yeah, that, that's why I would not want it on consent because I think that there's more to, um, more to it in the 
focus. I just want focus for the audit completion. Commissioner Nee Smith. <clears throat> I, I agree with um, Commissioner Wright that we need to get the work done that we have now. We see animal services as something that needs to be done very soon. And um, any, any distraction from that, I think, would be unfortunate. I also, I don't find this uh, risk assessment to be quantitative at all. I find it to be completely a matter of opinions and, and be, to be very qualitative. I don't know where this assessment tool came from, uh, but um, it, it, I don't like it. <laughs> just, it's just it's not quantitative at all. And having department members fill this out, you're going to get 50 different answers from 50 different people. I think the manager has the insight we need, and I think we have a little insight ourselves as to as to setting up a plan about where, what needs to be audited. Commissioner Thornton. I'm, I'm um, going back and still suggesting that it goes on consent. Uh, first of all, I think that the auditor is functioning based on the commission committee members. Um, we have asked her to do certain things and they were done. Um, now, this should not be a, a, a shadow on, uh, and, and some of the things that Commissioner uh, Wright said, I think might have been a little bit helpful for me if I've known them earlier. Um, I don't think that, I think that we had agreed to get some samples of other um, departments or s samples of what was, how they did their audit thing, how they did their audit. Um, there seems to be um, some misunderstanding on the role of the uh, manager and the auditor's um, roles and responsibility. Um, I think it's a bit embarrassing that we're having this conversation at this point. If there, this audit was what we directed and we moved out of committee, and now I'm hearing these different interpretations on whose role is what. And maybe we need to go back to um, the drawing board and be very clear. But because if I would have known some of the things I'm hearing now, I would not have voted to send it out. We would have corrected in committee. So sometimes we, you know, we put people out there and we got all of this information and then we wait till we get on TV or in, a, in, in public and we throw it out there like, it's not right. Now, let's, I, I will be the first one to say, no, we don't need it to go on um, consent, but we surely need to, for people to either come to the audit committee or give us information so we can do the best thing instead of, this should have never come out of, out of committee after hearing what I've heard. And I do not feel good about the way it was done. And if you had read your packages beforehand, we could have probably nipped it in the bud before we came tonight. So that's my, my thought. It's no way in the world I would have voted to, to roll this out if I've had the concerns um, that I've heard tonight. All of you could have sent every committee person an email. Commissioner Denson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm fine with this. I, honest, I uh, honestly trust that the Office of Operational Analysis and the Audit Committee, which rec recommend this, uh, have created a, a system that's going to work. I see that they beta tested it. It sounds like it worked okay and wasn't it didn't take up too much time from the departments. And I honestly, yeah, I would expect and want the Office of Operational Analysis to have all this kind of information on all of our departments. I mean, that's that way they can actually analyze their operations of those departments. And and I do think it is important. So I, I pulled up the the mission statement of the Office of Operational Analysis, 
and it says it's to provide quality internal audit services through independent and objective reviews and assessments of the activities, operations, financial systems, and internal accounting controls that support the mayor commission's adopted goals and strategies. And so a lot of the financial stuff I see here are what I would consider like internal accounting controls and financial systems. And I think that um, I know from the past looking at audit reports that we've had where there's it's shown that there's issues, it's because we have inconsistent um, accounting controls in some of our departments. And I think this is a great way for us to actually ensure the consistency across all departments. I think it's something that definitely needs to happen. And I'm honestly kind of confused by the pushback of this, that we wouldn't want to have this information in the hands of our Office of Operational Analysis. And moving forward in the future, sure, in in this next year, it might take a little bit more time for our departments because they're all going to have to do this. But in the long run, after they have this stuff, it's going to make our audits more streamlined going forward, uh, happen faster, and again, be more consistent with the outcomes. Um, So I think this is a a no-brainer, and I support it. And I also trust that the audit committee and the office would... Uh, hone this moving forward so that this questionnaire, I'm sure maybe some issues will pop up here and there, but to hone it and to make it um, better as, as they move forward. Commissioner Edwards. Thank you. I, uh, I, I did vote in the audit committee to send this here. And the way that I understood the creation of this document was to be a means to collect preliminary information on which the audit committee could base their recommendation for an audit work plan, which then would come to this body. Um, Two questionnaires came to us. One, we had questions that came back, then this one came. We looked at it. We voted to approve it to come here. Um, I, too, think that it's... uh, I think that it's a a good document to send out to collect that preliminary information uh, to help guide the recommendations of the audit committee. Um, If if someone has some specific edits or or anything like that, I'd I'd certainly entertain them. Um, But uh, it looked like a good first step for me uh, just to gain that preliminary information for the audit committee. Thank you. Commissioner Parker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I too am supportive of the passage of this protocol. Um, as Commissioner Denson said, I have a lot of faith in the audit committee. I have a lot of faith in the auditor. Having read over the questionnaire myself, it, I don't see any reason why the Office of Operational Analysis shouldn't have access to this information. If anything, it creates a global picture of trends and potential exposures and different departments that, the, as um, Commissioner Edwards said, can be used to hone the, um, the, scope, the, the scope and um, nature of potential audits to then, as a commission, have us decide upon. Um, and I also don't see any reason why the passage of this protocol would it hinder the productivity of audit activities um, that are currently on, ongoing. Um, if anything, it will streamline those in future and ensure the continued success of the office. So if, unless, any, unless I'm missing anything, why those two, the passage of this and the work of the operational analysis office would be conflicting in some way, I would su- con- urge everyone to support moving this forward as it looks very sound. All right, moving on to uh, last item of the public session tonight. Um, uh, this is a, an amendment to the moratorium resolution on Oakland Avenue. We've uh, seen similar amendments to um, moratoria in the past, uh, d- just to allow for a certain range of activities. Um, Commissioner Edwards, do you want to talk a little bit about what, what, what this would permit? Sure. Uh, this will permit applications for demolition review on the side and back elevations, uh, nothing that would affect the front elevations or the front roof lines. So this is a similar amendment to what was passed in the Millage Circle (coughs) demolition moratorium. This issue came up, um, two residents in the study area, uh, one of which has purchased the property in question that was slated to be created uh, into a Airbnb uh, party mansion, 
Uh, he wants to fix his back deck. Um, and then there's uh, the other person came to me. It was the one person in the neighborhood I was unable to get in touch with. He was out of town for much of the summer. And he had already committed to expand his home out the back about 14 feet and, and had already purchased the windows. So I began uh, contacted frequently from the contractor in this, in this homeowner. So this will be a nice amendment to allow for these projects to move forward while maintaining the historical integrity of this corridor while the planning department studies it. I appreciate your support. If we can move it to consent, that'd be cool. Everybody fine moving this to consent? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and we now know in answer to the earlier question, somebody's house can be party mansion. So it's, uh, you, you choose the name if, uh, if it so applies. Uh, just uh, uh, before the public departs, just a quick programming note. Uh, we anticipate that uh, we will have the December voting meeting, a uh, short retreat in December, and then we'll not have a work session or agenda setting meeting in December. So we will have a early dismissal of public activity in a formal way um, before convening for uh, just a couple items on a special called session in January. All right. Thank you for members of the public for being with us. We have a short executive session to follow. <laughs>